Patterson and Michael Remus. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Hustler Patterson, along with the CTO Michael Remus. And uh, ooh, we got a packed show today. Big game tonight for the Winnipeg Jets. They need two points, and they need it in the worst way. They're in Dallas taking on the Stars, who uh, come into tonight's action four points ahead of Winnipeg in the race for a wild card spot in the Western Conference. Ken Weeb, Weeb's world himself, uh, traveling the world, if you will, coming to us from parts unknown a little bit later on. We'll get Ken's thoughts on tonight's game, um, as well as the weekend overall and this um, incredibly important next three games on the road for the Winnipeg Jets before they get back home to Canada Life Center next week. Tonight in Dallas, Friday in Arizona, and, or sorry, Friday in Colorado, excuse me, and finishing up the road trip Sunday against the Yotes in Arizona. Uh, we are also going to be joined by Reed Fowler. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about this on the program lately. You usually get into more golf talk sort of in the, in the off season of hockey. Um, but this story surrounding the Saudi Golf League and Phil Mickelson is one of the most interesting sports business stories of the year. Reed Fowler from DraftKings is going to pop by. We'll probably poke him for a couple picks for the Honda Classic, but very interested to talk to him about uh, Phil Mickelson's sponsors walking away from him and the extended post that he put out yesterday, semi-apologizing for some of the things that he'd said, allegedly off the record. Alan Shipnuck obviously disagreed with that. That should be a real fun conversation. We'll have that towards the end of the program. And to start things off in about 15 or so, we will welcome in Blue Bomber back-to-back Grey Cup champ and the most outstanding Canadian in the Grey Cup game, Nick Dembski, for a little off-season check-in. We'll see how Nick's doing, how he's handling this winter, and what he thinks about the moves that his club has made as they look to try and run it back again. Uh, and, of course, one of the big topics today we'll be getting to is the new voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. We'll touch on that in just a second with Michael Remus. Before we do that, I do want to thank all of our sponsors, F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Canadian Club Whiskey, and of course, Cool Bet Canada. We cannot do it without the sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. Um, if you are listening on the podcast, if you do have the opportunity to uh, rate, uh, give us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, or on Spotify, certainly helps us grow the channel. Always appreciative. And if you're watching the YouTube um, video later on, post when we do it live, um, we always appreciate you leaving in a comment about the show, about some of the topics that we're talking about, what you think maybe about some of the uh, lineup decisions tonight. Uh, and I know we're going to be talking about Patrick Liney as well. So you can put your Liney takes in the comments as well. Always just hit us up. Make sure you hit the red subscribe button and uh, like the video as well. All right, there's our YouTuber spiel to get things going. Let's get Michael Remus in here as we uh, start it off. And of course, welcome everybody joining us live in our Winnipeg Sports Talk chat here on YouTube. What's going on, fella? I'm feeling good. Huss. I'm in a great mood. We had some, you know, as down as the Jets are getting us. I am excited about tonight's game against Dallas, but I'm also excited waking up to some news. This was a big topic of the offseason. As you said, CFL free agency. It's been wild. Not only are <laughs> players moving teams, but broadcasters too. So we woke up to the story today that Derek Taylor taking over from Bob Irving. Massive shoes to fill, but if there's anyone who can do it, it's DT. So passionate about the CFL. Great with the, with the numbers. More importantly, his voice of the Riders. And that's just another win for the Bombers over, over the Riders. Stole Willie Jefferson. You know, beat them in back-to-back -back playoffs, and now, and now stole their play-by-play -play guy. So, uh, pump for 
DT returning to Winnipeg was voice of the Bisons, worked at TSN. And uh, I thought this was uh, great news. Yeah, this was, and you know, we had sort of alluded to it that this certainly did sound like a very realistic possibility when uh, it was announced last week that DT was stepping down as the play-by-play -play voice of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and the host of the Sports Cage on CKRM and Regina. And, you know, certainly, especially in the present media landscape, you wondered, um, you assumed that there was going to be another shoe to fall. Um, you know, DT didn't announce anything at the time. Obviously, they needed to uh, get things ready to promote the uh, the announcement at the right time for OB and the Bombers and all parties involved. But there was tons of speculation that it would be DT coming back. And, you know, you just sort of mentioned his background with the Bisons in Saskatchewan. It is somewhat ironic that we've got Nick Dembski joining us today because, of course, Dembski was a bomber. Dembski started his career as a Saskatchewan Rough Rider and then came back to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers to his hometown and became a back-to-back -back Grey Cup champion. And, you know, while DT did not grow up here, spent a long portion of his life here, um, as you mentioned, was a longtime voice of the Manitoba Bisons, including back when I was working at the U of M. And I'll tell you what, DT just did a phenomenal job. Um, and then, of course, was, you know, probably, I would say, of everyone that's worked involved in CFL coverage over the last number of years, Reem, I mean, DT was the most innovative guy when it came to covering the Canadian Football League and giving CFL fans more than, you know, what had traditionally been given. The details segment was borderline revolutionary with, you know, some of the work that he's done in, the film that he breaks down. Um, and I think it made him just that much better of a broadcaster. But uh, from Winnipeg to Regina and back to Winnipeg, Derek Taylor is here. I know he's very, very excited. A big congratulations to his wife, Fiona, as well. Actually, uh, another former Kelvin Clipper went to high school with Fiona. And I know she loved it out in Saskatchewan. Uh, but this sounds like a great move for the family and certainly for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. A coup to get DT coming here. Um, you know, with so many bright years ahead of him, having already established himself as, uh, you know, one of the most knowledgeable and go-to people in CFL media to come here and fill the size 22 is left by Bob Irving, Remus. Um, we knew that whoever was taking this job had massive shoes to fill. But I'll tell you what, I think Derek Taylor comes with the resume and the passion for this community, this football team, and the Canadian Football League. And uh, I think this is a home run hire. Yes, well well said, Hustler. And some people were asking us, well, what does he sound like? Let's hear it. I did post a video on our Twitter, Sports Talk WPG. I had to take a, you know, it sucks. I had to pull a highlight that was like a positive rider's play. <laughs> but I mean... <laughs> there wasn't many of them. You had to, you had yeah. to really look for her, went, far in that game. I went to the West Final and I grabbed... Uh, the clip of him calling uh, the Duke Williams long touchdown at the end of the first half. So that is on our Twitter page if you want to hear a sample. Although DT says that game was tough for him. His voice was uh, really high because of the cold. And that game was very cold, the West Final. I'll never, never forget. Almost as cold as uh, it is now, but not, not, quite, not quite there. It is freezing outside and it was nice to wake up to some positive news because you know going outside every day is just such a such a struggle and we hope us that the jets can put a smile on our face tonight in dallas yeah well uh, i i mean it all says i'm in a good mood today i'm back putting the positive my smile on mm -hmm. i'm feeling good i was just down yesterday as so many people were mm -hmm. and listen the hockey team <laughs> i'll be the first to admit i'm in a great mood when they have big wins and the disappointing losses and there's been many of them this season you know sort of weigh on you as you go in to talk about it for a couple hours with all of you that are so passionate about the hockey team but i'll tell you what it is the weather right now that is absolutely compounding everything i i <laughs> I drove yesterday, Reem. I had to run a couple errands, mm -hmm. and I was moving from Ellis Avenue. I wanted to get onto Saint uh, Saint Matthews, yeah. And I just I don't know what I was thinking. I turned down one of the the side streets. I want to say it was Clifton oh, or something in the impossible. West End. I, 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 this was like driving on the surface of the moon. I, I in my life have never been in ruts like this, and of course someone was coming up, and I had to move into the right lane. It was impossible. You could not get out of the rut. Yes. The poor lady had to drive back about 50 yards, basically to the intersection, so I could get in. Um, yeah, the combination of all the snow, the weather, a lot of the other things going around, I think has been 
uh, you know, it's been treading on people. Um, but I'll tell you what, we got a game coming up tonight, a uh, big homestand coming up in March. And, you know, for the Winnipeg Jets, just to bring it back to the hockey, um, they can't be thinking big picture right now. They got to think about two points. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to be really fascinated to see how this team comes out tonight because of just how devastating that loss was. And I think that was another thing that weighed heavy on people. I know on the post-game shows on IC and Kenny and Rennie and certainly in our chat yesterday, um, you know, it was the way that that game went, how close it was, blowing it on, a, you know, unfortunately a careless play that ended up in their back of the net in the final final minute. Um, and, you know, with the predicament the Winnipeg Jets are in, um, it really does put them behind the eight ball. And I think that's what made, you know, just that game that much more devastating for people that follow the team. So uh, it's time to pick themselves up tonight. I mean, there's no tomorrow. Um, it is all about this game against the Dallas Stars. And, you know, interestingly, I mean, they could get quite close to Dallas with the win tonight. Although, as we see what's going on in the standings right now, night after night in the in the National Hockey League, um, still lots of work to do for the Winnipeg Jets. Seven points back of the Los Angeles Kings and needing to pass the Dallas Stars and the Anaheim Ducks and the Vancouver Canucks to get there. So uh, no room for error right now, especially tonight against a team that they are chasing. Yeah, and we can bring up the lines. A couple lineup changes for tonight here. Let's go. Uh, Stasny, Shafley, Wheeler, uh, Connor, Dubois, Svechnikov moving with those guys. Harkins, Lowry, Veselainen. Adam Brooks moving from the second line to the fourth line with Tony Nato and Pogansky. Um, Christian Reichel, he's week to week now with an injury. So Veselainen. Going in, CJ Cease is on the roster. He practiced in a regular jersey. And then on defense, we have Morrissey DeMello, Dylan Pionk, and Nate Beaulieu, who's in for Logan Stanley. He's a healthy scratch. For, with, oh, we got the two Nates. Nate Beaulieu, Nate Schmidt. I just realized they both have the same name. And Dylan Sandberg <laughs> did practice in a regular jersey as well. I don't know if we'll see him at some point. He's coming back from another injury. So those are the lines. I mean, I saw, you know, we tweeted this out. Someone commented the six seeing Vessel line in the lineup. Well, they got nobody else. Perfetti's hurt. Cops hurt. <laughs> Reichel's hurt. DJ Cease, they're trying to ease him back from an injury. I mean, they picked up Adam Brooks off waivers, and he's on the second line. This is the state of the Jets right now, and you're playing against a Dallas team who's been, you know, pretty surprisingly good this, this year, and they're ahead of you in the standings. So the Jets need... Need a win. I mean, this is the one. These Dallas games, I think you're circled on the calendar saying, okay, you got to pick up two here because they're essentially a four point game within the division. You know, you get two, you're preventing Dallas from getting two. And you had the disappointing uh, result in Calgary. So let's go. I'm excited. Excited to see, uh, you know, them bounce back today. Oh, yeah. Hellbuck in net, of course. Yeah. This, um, I mean, the Jets, you know, come into this game 50 games played and 52 points. Dallas, 49 games played and 56 points. I mean, a regulation loss would put them six back of Dallas, never mind the other teams that they've got to catch, um, and Dallas would have a game in hand. You win in regulation, you're two points back. This is, listen, I know we say, oh, it's crazy to say these games are must-wins at this point in the season. With the predicament the Winnipeg Jets are in, this is a must-win. So uh, they do need to get it. Um, I'll be honest. I mean, like many people, I'm quite stunned that Logan Stanley's out and Nate Beaulieu is in. And we can talk about Stanley and Billy Hanela and, you know, some of the other players that uh, Dylan Sandberg, who might be available. Um, and we're going to try and get some comments from uh, Dave Lowry, uh, maybe before we get into it with Weaver. Um, but I, uh, that I was quite surprised um, at, at that. And I mean, listen, I don't want to do a rag on Nate Beaulieu um, because I mean, I think he does what he's capable of and what he's asked to do for the Winnipeg Jets when he gets in the lineup. But, I mean, this is a guy that is a 7th, 8th, ninth defenseman right now. And, um, you know, for uh, it, it's obvious that, that Dave Lowry hasn't been too pleased with Logan Stanley. Um, but I think what's interesting about this is that they go back to the veteran um, as opposed to one of the young players that, you know, have been sort of pushing for ice time. Of course, Philly Hanel is spending some time with the Moose, getting some big minutes. Um, but that, that to me was the big surprise of the morning that Bolio is in and Logan Stanley's out. Yeah, I agree. But I think it seems like Logan Stanley has fallen out of favor here with, uh, with the coach and he spoke about, uh, Svechnikov as well. Um, I think at some point has, as the season goes on, 
I wonder if we're going to start to see more of these young defensemen. Dylan Sandberg, I thought, looked good. Declan Chisholm as well. So I wonder if you see those guys. But the question is, who do you take out? I mean, you got five of those spots stapled. Morrissey, DeMello, Dylan, Pionk, Schmidt. I don't think you're taking those guys out. How do you make room for all these defensemen? I think that's a, a question Chevy's going to have to solve. Um, you know, what do you do with all these young guys who some of them seem to be ready for the NHL? And you also have a bunch of expansive veterans and you're near the cap and your team is out of a playoff spot. So as we approach the deadline, which is now, you know, less than a month away, March 21st, this is going to be, I think that's going to be a big day here. Although leading up, you know, usually all the trades get done now leading up and, you know, you're just twiddling your yeah. thumbs. Well, I, I mean, listen, the, the blue line is a huge mm -hmm. topic and, mm -hmm. And I, I still have not completely put the final nail in the coffin no. for this season. I mean, if you, you run six or seven off or go on a run like Calgary, I realize that seems like uh, far from possible right now. But if it did happen, I mean, you're right back in the mix. Um, so, I mean, there still is time to go on a run and get back into it. But if that doesn't happen and we're getting close to this deadline or you know, even a couple of weeks before, they've sort of determined that, you know, it's not happening. Uh, what you just brought up, Remus, when it comes to the Jet Blue Line, to me, is going to be the most interesting thing that happens, uh, you know, at, at the deadline. Uh, listen, you can trade Cop, you can trade Stastny, you can trade Nate Bull, you, um, you know, anyone on an expiring contract to get an asset, whatever you can get, and I don't think anyone would have an issue with it. Where it gets more complicated is dealing one of your five defensemen that are signed to contracts uh, for the next couple seasons. I mean, De DeMello, Stan uh, D well, I'll leave the League of Logan Stanley out because, of course, he's the one, you know, the younger player that doesn't have that sort of term but is under team control. But between Morrissey, Pionk, Nate Schmidt, Brendan Dillon, and uh, Dylan DeMello, all of these players come with a an invoice for the next couple seasons. And it's very easy for general managers to make moves to take on guys for the rest of the season without having to commit to them going forward. Um, and that, I think, to be honest, is going to, you know, be a little bit more challenging for Kevin Sheveldayoff if they did get to the position where they figured they wanted to move on one or two of these players to open up spots, both cap space and opportunity for these younger players, finding that partner that makes sense, both in the short term, but also with the contracts that come with those players um, might be the biggest challenge for Sheveldayoff when it comes to the um, comes to the deadline. Yeah, well, I think the Jets got them, and you know they didn't have to give up a lot. So maybe you try to get some of those picks back. Um, I don't know. I think that is that's the question. I think to watch. Maybe I don't know if that's a in season deal or an off season deal. But I mean, I think in terms of the deadline, yeah, Cop is the name you know, you're going to see out there. I wonder about Paul Stasny. I mean, he's playing on the first line now, but I think that's just because of the injuries. That they've had, but I mean, he's been productive and I think could help a team in a uh, bottom six role if they were a uh, contender. For sure. But I mean, those guys and the guys that come without any term going forward, unless, I mean, maybe Cop heats up, goes on a bit of a heater, mm -hmm. gets some points. I mean, people know that he can bring a number of things to a team and can play in a number of different roles. But I mean, you're not getting first round picks back for these guys. Nope. I mean, you're trying to get, you know, maybe you'll squeeze a second out of Cop or a second in another pick. And I believe when Stastny was traded the last time at the deadline, he was moved for a fourth. So, I mean, this isn't going to be a franchise-changing haul for the unrestricted free agents. Um, but anything that happens beyond that is, you know, for the Winnipeg Jets, is would be looking into the future. Now, you know, as I said, there's a lot of hockey left to be played before we even get to that trade deadline. Um, but it has been interesting, Remus, some of the conversations that we were having, you know, a few months ago during the first real sort of slide for the Winnipeg Jets that ended up with Paul Maurice leaving and talking about Mark Shifley now being picked up amongst some, you know, other markets and other hockey insiders, including Frank Cervelli, who speculated on Mark Shifley's future on Friday on Daily Faceoff. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like what's happened, people around the league now are sort of paying attention and going, wait a second, what's happened to the Winnipeg Jets this season? Like with the expectations that they had, not just in this market, but by a lot of those people that cover the league, I think people have just been assuming the Jets would be back in it, it would be a playoff team. And where we're at right now, that does seem unlikely. Um, and now I think more and more people that, you know, are really paying attention to the inner workings as well as the deadline, um, are now talking about Mark Shifley a little bit more. And, um, you know, listen, this is a, a topic that we've spent plenty of time and talked about with plenty of individuals on it before. Um, but there would be no more 
core changing move for the Winnipeg Jets to uh, to make than, you know, something that, you know, involved number 55. Um, but it would also come, I mean, there's a little bit of a different story. We were talking about maybe some of the challenges to trading some of the defensemen because of the couple years of term. With Mark Shifley, it's the exact opposite. You're getting a guy that is an elite point scorer in the National Hockey League with two years left on, um, for the market, a very, very team-friendly deal, and you'd be getting three playoff runs out of him. So if they ever came to the point where they were even considering it or talking to other teams, if that if that sort of a deal happened in and around the deadline, that would be uh, that would be a massive one for the Winnipeg Jets. And you know, much like the Dubois line A trade last year, Remus would be one that you know could absolutely determine um, you know Kevin Sheveldayoff's. Uh, you know, it would be one of the signature moments of Kevin Sheveldayoff's term as general manager, and you know would be probably the most impactful deal when it comes to what's happening with this club going forward into future seasons. Yeah, that was Frank on Friday. I'll have to go see if I can grab the clip on DFO Rundown. He was just said there were rumblings that it could be his last season in Winnipeg. Now, I don't know what that means, but Frank seems to be pretty plugged in. And speaking, you know, so we'll have to wait and see if anything would happen, but I would think you'd want to get a center back. Otherwise, you're kind of weak down the middle. But in terms of franchise changing moves, I know we've got Nick Dembski coming up, Hus, but Patrick Laine last night. I mean, if you're, I think everyone in Winnipeg still has a affection for this player. The goal, Most the heater, do. the heater that he's been on, and the goals that he scored last night, putting one through Austin Matthews' legs in overtime. I mean, his release, his shot. There is nothing like it. It's absolutely incredible, and it still is. I mean, Dubois has been great, but it is disappointing that Laine is no longer. Uh, on the Jets, when you see goals like that, and you remember the feeling that you got when he would put him in uh, in the Jets, Jets blue, not the Blue Jackets. You know, blue. we'll we'll talk more about this later on. I didn't want to just give it a couple minutes, but shout out to Bitch and everyone else that's riding with us on those season overs for Patrick Line. We are just about there, two goals away. Uh, all right, uh, Ken Weeb coming up. We'll get ready for Jets in Dallas tonight. Reed Fowler of DraftKings later on and coming up in just a second. Our guy Nick Dembski of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Uh, before we do that, a big thank you to our friends over at F Apparel who are ready for the summer with Winnipeg's finest custom suits for men at amazing prizes. Not just custom suits, uh, but dress shirts, winter jackets, chinos, golf pants, untucked dress shirts, shoes, ties, accessories, and more. Every guy needs at least one suit that fits and looks great. And F's custom-made suits start at just $400. And of course, they're the go-to spot for grads as well. If you have a high school graduate that is graduating this year, pop down to F Apparel, show your current student ID, and uh, they'll hook them up with a free tie and dress shirt along with their suit. You can get it all starting at $400. F Apparel, EPH Apparel Online, or a pop down and see them locally owned, 190 Smith Street downtown. Of course, it's heart month. And Vita Health Fresh Market continues to be the go-to spot for healthy alternatives, organics, new vitamins, and supplements. And uh, with the best prices in Winnipeg on the best selection of natural and organic supplements, beauty products, and groceries. Not to mention delicious lunch options like Vita Market salads, soups, sandwiches, and more at the Vita Grab and Go Deli. You can join their exclusive Vita VIP list by texting Vita VIP to 1 877 630 1970 to receive special offers all year long and be entered to win a $100 Vita Health gift card. Seven locations for Vita Health, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. And while we're taking care of the heart and the body, uh, you know that it all starts with being hydrated. And of course, our friends at Culligan Water, family owned, have been the go-to people for all water services in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba for over 65 years. They have got it all. Water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, citywide water delivery services, as well as commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Go down and see them at 1200 Sargent Avenue. 694-5180 is the number to hit them up or check them out online at drinkculligan.com. Uh, all right, well, we had some big news today about a returning former Winnipegger coming back to work with the Blue Bombers. And as I mentioned, it was somewhat ironic that uh, we had a guy go from the Bisons to the Riders, back to the Blue Bombers, 
We were talking about the new voice of the Bombers, Derek Taylor, but our next guest made a, a similar trek a few years back. It is our guy. He is the rating most outstanding Canadian from the Grey Cup and two-time Grey Cup champ, Nick Damsky. Nick, what's up? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. Good, man. It's great to have you back on the program. We haven't chatted since uh, since the Grey Cup. First of all, congratulations on another championship. I mean, uh, what an amazing season. What an amazing run for you and your teammates. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was for sure. I mean, uh, you know, it's pretty crazy. Last two years, I mean, a lot of the same faces came back and, you know, we all had the same goal in mind and that was obviously go get the Grey Cup. So, I mean, it feels great to to accomplish it and now my sights are already set on 2022, so I just came back from the gym today, and, uh, you know, I'm ready to go. Well, that's what uh, Bomber fans are loving to hear. Tons of love and welcome to uh, get you back on the program in the chat. It has been a wild few months, and you know that this happens with a championship team. We'll talk about the offseason in a second, but, uh, I mean, the fact that we haven't chatted since the big game, I mean, uh, where's the uh, most outstanding Canadian trophy right now? I mean, uh, just tell us a little bit more about your, uh, your the role, the, the big play in the game, and the way you and your team were able to come back in the fourth quarter, win it in overtime, and uh, bring another championship back to your hometown. No doubt. Well, yeah, j just to get it out the way, you know, it, it is right there. I'm looking at it right now. So it, it sits nice in my living room on a, on a shelf here so for all the visitors to see. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, it, it was awesome, man. Uh, you know, the fourth quarter, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I said this in another interview just not too long ago, like with the way our defense was playing all year this year, we, you know, myself, you know, on that last drive when Hamilton was going against the wind, I thought, you know, I thought it was over, really. You know, I thought our defense was going to stop them. They weren't even going to drive down the field. And next thing you know, you know, play after play, I was like getting a little bit worried here. I'm like, oh, man, it might not even be a field goal. They might go down and score. Like, what's going to happen here? But, you know, our defense, uh, they did a great job of stopping them on the goal line. Uh, and, you know, Hamilton, you know, they're, they're a great team. They got a great offense. So, you know, it, it wasn't by surprise, but at the same time, you know, our defense, they, they played outstanding all year and they played outstanding in, in overtime. And, and uh, you know, we, we did our thing in the, in, the, in the fifth quarter there to win the Great Cup. So I couldn't be, uh, be more nothing but proud of this team. You know what? You know, we've spoken to a number of your teammates on both sides of the football. And the one thing that continues to come out is that, you know, the unwavering belief um, in each other and the ability to get the job done and come back because this is a very different great cup than the last time against Hamilton. I mean, sure. you guys pretty much manhandled those guys for a full 60 um, in Calgary. I mean, the game in Hamilton with a hostile crowd and the wind conditions were so different. I mean, what do you remember about going into that fourth quarter, um, the wind switching and you finally getting it back for the first time again yeah. uh, since the first quarter, but also knowing that for the first time in a long time, you had a pretty big hill to climb to get back in on, on top. On top. No doubt. Well, I mean, you know what? The, fir the first half, the first half to us, like... We thought we should have been down by more the way that we kind of came out the first half. Hamilton definitely, you know, they had the momentum. They're, the, you know, again, they're they're a great team. They're playing good football. So uh, when we came back out the second half, you know, that's one thing that we, we just believe that we could come back from any game. Um, you know, it was kind of the first time I'm pretty sure that we're down going into the into the second half. So that was a little bit, uh, you know, it hit a little bit differently. But, you know, we all stayed motivated and we knew the task at hand and, and our defense played great. And our offense made a couple of big plays, you know, shout out to shout out to Darvin, shout out to Rashid, shout out to Zach, shout out to the whole line, Andrew, you know, I could shut down the whole list. But, you know, uh, you know, definitely the play that stood out to me, obviously, was, you know, when 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 I took it in uh, for the 30 yard pass or whatever it was. And I mean, at that point, you know, I had the ball in my hands a couple of times that game and Hamilton was doing a great job shutting me down. So, you know, when I got that play, you know, I just knew I had to make it make it hit and, and make it last. So. You know, I had to do everything I could to to get across that goal line. Certainly did. Um, you know, another you know incredible historic victory for the team. And you mentioned, you know, what is at stake or what is possible, I guess, going into this season. But you know, going back, it was such a weird time because it was right before. And thank God we got the game in when we did, because I mean, honestly, with what happened with COVID, dude. If I mean, yeah. if that game was a week or two later, I'm not sure where we're, whether we're having the same conversation. Uh, but we came back. There was the big party at the stadium. And then you really went into, you know, sort of a quieter time. I mean, how did you celebrate? What were the, what were the highlights of the uh, victory tour number two? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we ripped up Winnipeg, that's for sure. <laughs> we had a great time in Winnipeg, uh, you know, from Earl's to the Palomino. I mean, we did it all. So, um, 
you know, it was my birthday that weekend or that week as well after getting home for the Great Cup. So, you know, I let let the party ride into the birthday festivities, and and you know, it was it was just a great time, man. You know, we we really do have a we had a great locker room. I mean, a lot of those guys came back, so it's awesome. But you know, just uh, you know, we we knew that you know, two years in a row winning a Great Cup, you know, not everybody was going to be able to come back, so. It was definitely a moment that we wanted to last forever. So, you know, we, we, uh, we partied like it too. <laughs> well, you know, what? And, um, and you know, you mentioned the players coming back. I mean, pretty clear that, um, you know, pretty much to a man, um, the guys on that team last year, you know, realized how special the group it was and, you know, the potential of what could be possible with a third season. I mean, you had a deal when, when things were going in at the beginning of free agency or before the, we actually got to free agency and you saw, Jackson Jeff Code and Big Hill and Willie Jefferson and some of the top players. Of course, Zach Caleros come back. Um, you know, as a guy that was already going to be there, I mean, it must have been, you know, pleasing to you. But what does that say yeah. to the rest of the players about the commitment that many of these guys have, probably leaving some money on the table to come back, continue as blue bombers and uh, try and make it three? For sure. And I, I mean, you know what? It says a lot about, you know, just the guys that we have in this locker room because, you know, they're not, they're not, you know, obviously we're playing to, to, to pay the bills and everything, but they're also playing because of the love of the love of the sport and love of their teammates. So when you have such a good culture here and, and, you know, everybody gets along with everybody, you know, it really is hard to leave. And, uh, you know, I was just fortunate to have, you know, I signed a two year deal last year. So, you know, I was, I was staying put no matter what, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just happy that, you know, the core of the team stayed and, uh, and we and we have a lot of good players coming back, and and you know they did we did a, a good job story in free agency getting some new new faces as well. So I'm excited to get this thing going, man. Yeah, well, I mean, and uh, one of the guys, I mean, there has been a bit of a change over at uh, receiver. I mean, Kenny Lawler, uh, you know, cre credit to him. I mean, got a massive deal, and we know how short these careers are, and he jumped at it. But uh, uh, Greg Ellingson coming in, I mean, this is a guy with five 1,000-yard seasons in the Canadian Football League, he, uh, a very, very illustrious receiver. Um, what do you know about Greg? Have you talked to him at all? And uh, how do you think he'll fit into uh, the offense? Yeah, I actually haven't talked to him yet. You know, I, <laughs> thanks for reminding me. I, I probably should reach out to him. But, um, no, from, from what I know, I mean, I, I know him and Zach got along when they are in Hamilton together. And, uh, you know, I know he's an explosive receiver and, and makes big plays downfield, you know. And I never really talked to him all that much. But, you know, the few times that I did talk to him, you know, I, kn I know that he's a really nice guy. And, uh, and, you know, he cares about football and he cares about winning. So, um, you know, it's been a while for him since since he's gotten a great cup. So, you know, I'm sure he's hungry for one and, and, and he's going to bring that that motivation to hunger over here. So I'm excited. I'm excited and looking forward really to working with him. We had him on, I guess, last week uh, to talk about coming to, to Winnipeg. He's got a massive dog named Odin and, uh, <laughs> you know, likes to crank out the Call of Duty. Speaking of Call of Duty, the other guy we had on the program is Rashid Bailey. And you mentioned Sheed beforehand yeah. having a big play. Is he the most intense human being you've ever met in your life? He's intense, man. You know what? He, he doesn't play games. You know, he's a he's a great dude. Don't get me wrong. You know, uh, I mean, even though being intense doesn't make you a bad dude, but he's a great dude. Uh, you know, emotional, a lot of a lot of care and, and kindness in him. But that man's intense now. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. He's intense. He might he might rip some people's heads off this year. We'll see. He has he has the most passion. Um, and it seems like it's 24-7, 365. And we were joking at some of these, you know, lackluster starts we've seen the Jets having lately. We need to get Sheed in the locker room for a 10-minute <laughs> speech before they go out to start. I think they might be uh that might solve a lot of problems. Well, it's, it's funny because I mean he works at a gym in the offseason, and uh, you know, sometimes I'll be on the phone with him and you know, he, he straight up, he'll give me a warning saying, hey, I just did a gym session, uh, you know, so my, my voice is kind of raspy right now. And I'll be like, OK, uh, I know how much you're yelling because it's like that all the time. You know, I'm sure as soon as he gets out of bed, you know, that, that, you know, that man is motivated and ready to go and ready to give anybody a speech, you know, waking them up. You know, that's just that's just who she is. But I love I, it. I, I envision him giving him himself a speech looking in the bathroom mirror. The first thing sure that he does. does in the morning, you know, <laughs> just get himself going and then just let it spread. It was a lot of fun. It, folks, if you missed that. Um, check it out. Uh, we'll uh, we'll tag it up after this if uh, if you missed our conversation. She'd be a, little, a lot of fun. Um, it was great to get most of those guys back. I do have to ask you about Andrew Harris moving on to Toronto. I mean, he's a guy. I mean, of course, you guys are both Winnipeg boys, Oak Park um, products. 
Um, and he's sort of been, you know, in a big brother in some ways to, uh, you know, especially some of the younger local guys. We know it's a tough business and sometimes these things happen. But uh, from your perspective, I mean, uh, what did you make? I mean, and is it hard to imagine the Bombers without Andrew Harris in that room and in that huddle? Yeah, it's still, you know, it still feels a little weird. I mean, uh, I don't think it's fully going to hit me until uh, until we get to training camp. And, and, you know, I don't see him there. I don't see 33 in the locker room, honestly. And, uh, you know, it, it definitely is a little bit weird. It's, uh, you know, just even talking to him, I'm still, like, thinking it's, like, some sort of, you know, dream or something like that. But, you know, uh, I know I know Andrew will be okay. He uh, he has a good situation out in Toronto. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, I mean, I always want what's best uh, for the player. Um, you know, it sucks that – Nothing was able to get worked out, but at the end of the day, you know, that's pro sports for you. And, uh, you know, that's talking to everybody, you know, Darvin, who we lost, Kenny, who we lost, uh, Stephen Richardson, who we lost. You know, there's a couple of them that, uh, that you know, sometimes the, the business gets at you and, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. So, you know, you just got to find a way to move on and, and build from it. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always going to wish the best for them. But, you know, it, it definitely does suck. You know, in, in some ways, I think, you know, the younger players that, you know, really were in some ways probably mentored by Andrew over a number of years, well, what it takes to the commitment, you know, be a champion, what you need to do. I mean, we'll be there and be ready to take that next step. Um, but I mean, and I've said this many times, I mean, I think I, Andrew Harris's free agent signing is the most impactful in the history of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And some would argue, I mean, it's right up there with the most in Canadian football league history. Um, it, it, when people ask about, you know, what a difference maker Harris was on the field, in the dressing room. I mean, what do you remember about just how impactful and how he helped everybody become better and turn into champions eventually? Yeah, I mean, for me, example, you know, like when I came to Winnipeg, I mean, he kind of took me under his wing to, to you know, learn the offense. And, and you know, I love just picking out his brain too, just kind of seeing where his mindset is because, you know, Andrew, you know, he's an intense dude as well. He plays with a lot of passion and, and uh, you know, a lot of drive as well. And, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a guy that I, I know that that sort of passion and drive has to come from somewhere. So that's something that I picked his brain about. And, and you know, he's kind of even been able to, you know, give me hints and, and gems of how to unlock that passion and drive within my game as well. So, you know, just playing beside him and seeing how he prepares and see how he practices and, and uses that attitude, you know, day in and day out, not just in practice, but obviously in games as well. I mean, you know, it's definitely helped take my game to the next level. And, and I know that there's other people around the league that, that would say the exact same thing. Bomber receiver Nick Dembski is our guest here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Uh, we're now towards the end of February. Thank God this has been, I mean, you're a Winnipeg dude. I mean, this has been, I don't know, maybe the worst winter of our entire lives. Man, how, the how, worst. <laughs> how, how are you dealing? Have you gotten away at all? And uh, what, uh, what's keeping you busy right now? Yeah, I, ju I honestly just came back from Mexico, so that was, uh, that was a nice trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I did that, um, got that out of the way. Um, but yeah, you know, <laughs> this is crazy. You know, it, it's funny because I never thought I'd ever like, you know, want to leave Mexico, come back to Winnipeg. But I honestly felt that in my last day out there. You know, I'm ready to come home, ready to work out, ready to get back in the grind. You know, just got off the phone with Rashid Bailey, you know, so <laughs> Um, getting, you know, I really wanted to get back into things and, you know, probably by the time we landed and I saw how much snow there actually was here, how cold it was, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to turn this plane around and go back home. <laughs> I mean, you basically get two workouts a day, the one at the gym and the one shoveling the 15 centimeters that you just Straight got. Up, man. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. You know, it's, it's absolutely nuts how cold it is and how much snow's here, but you know what? It's home. So it is what it is. Yeah. We're all, we're all dealing with it and looking forward to it. Um, uh, this group, though, now, you know, you kind of mentioned to it, you're already thinking about next season. I mean, how exciting is it to know that um, not only you guys have done it twice, but you do have most of the core coming back of a championship nucleus with the potential to do something in winning three straight Grey Cups that hasn't been done since those legendary Warren Moon teams of the uh, uh, the well, then Eskimos, now Elks in the uh, in the 1980s. No doubt. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, as I said, we have a lot of core coming back. And a lot of the core who who's still ready to play some good football too. So, you know, that's the main thing. You know, we did lose some pieces. We lost some important pieces. But at the end of the day, you know, that's, you know, that's pro sports. You got to, you got to learn how to live with it and, and, and how to battle through it and, and, you know, 
just keep 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 going through the journey so you know i'm i'm ready to go back to work i'm ready to see what the new faces have to offer i'm ready to see, you know get get in tune with you know guys like greg and and get brady and johnny up to speed as well so you know we don't miss a miss a beat so you know we're all excited to get back to work and work together and uh and fill those missing gaps and and uh and start winning some football games you put put the skates on at all uh, this winter Honestly, I haven't. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's just too cold for me just to go because I'm I'm a big ODR type of guy, outdoor rinks type of guy. But um, honestly, just even the hockey leagues, you know, I haven't uh, I haven't got around to it. I've uh, I've been told a couple of times. Oh, here comes my dog now. <laughs> down. I've been told a couple of times I'll be a sub in uh, in a couple of games, but you know, I've still yet to get the call. So hopefully, you know, hopefully this will get that out there. <laughs> what's the, what's the dog's name and what kind of a dog we're getting the, the, the dogs of the bombers I know, on a weekly go. basis. New segment, huh? Um, <laughs> uh, so I got two dogs. I got a German, uh, two German shepherds. One name's Rue. She's the oldest. She's two and a half. She's a female. Uh, and then I got Boston. Who's about one in one in three months, I believe one in two months, maybe who's uh who's the male. So, you know, he's slowly, uh, Slowly getting bigger and, and bulkier. I don't know. He might take over this house soon. I'll we'll see how Rue feels about it. But, <laughs> They're yeah. keeping you busy? Oh, yeah. Two beauties, that's for sure. Let's see if I can get them on camera real quick. So this is this is the girl. He's that's chilling. Rue. And then that's Boston trying to look for something to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that is fantastic. Well, I got to tell you what. This, um, you know, once again, congratulations. I'm we've been meaning to, you know, hook back up with you and uh, talk about the big win, and I'll look ahead to next season. The other big news of the day, though, the uh, the massive shoes of Bob Irving being filled by Derek Taylor as the voice of the Blue Bombers over on OB. I mean, did you – I don't think you would have crossed paths with him in Saskatchewan, but – um. Back when you were a bison, I would imagine he would have been calling the team. Yeah, so I believe, uh, I think he was around from my first to third year. And then after that, I think he got a gig with TSN. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, like I definitely crossed paths with him during that. And then I just missed him in Saskatchewan. So when I came here, I believe he took over at the, as the role in Saskatchewan. So, you, you know, I, I know DT, it's, it's funny, you know, the little Winnipeg sports circle. So, uh, you know, I'm happy for him. I'm definitely going to have to reach out for him and congratulate him about that. Yeah, no doubt. Well, we're looking forward to having him on the program tomorrow and uh, certainly be awesome. looking forward to him. I mean, I don't think they could have had a better guy to come in and fit, fit, fill. I mean, no one will really fill the shoes of Bob Irving. I mean, oh, it's almost an tough. impossible task. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you don't know. This is a guy that lives, eats, and breathes Canadian football. He did it at a university level and has a real passion that we saw both at his TSN work and now with the Riders and uh I think it's a it's a big win for the Bombers. And uh, we were saying, if you thought CFL free agency was wild last week, now we got play-by-play -play guys signing as free agents right, with yeah, other teams. <laughs> what a league. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, man, great to catch up again. Uh, stay warm. Keep uh, I know I mean, the arms are good from all the shoveling you're doing. Uh, have some fun with the dogs. Uh, we'll look forward to catching up before the season. And uh, all the best to you, my friend. Thanks for doing this. Awesome. Appreciate it, man. Take yeah. care. At Dembski9 on Twitter, there is Nick Dembski, the most outstanding Canadian from the 2021 Grey Cup and uh, one of our all-time favorites, man. I can remember the damage he did at Oak Park. I remember what he did as a bison. I will never forget <laughs> complaining on the air back on 1290 that the Riders were going to pick him. I believe the Bombers had the number two pick and took Suk Chung. And I'm like, this Dembski's going to be a player. And uh, sure enough, the Riders did it. Um, but he ended up coming back and is now a two-time Grey Cup champion. Big thanks to you and Nick for popping by today on the program. And yes, as I mentioned, tomorrow, the new voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Derek Taylor, will join us first up on tomorrow's edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. All right. want to hear from Dave Lowry. And I do believe we've got that. Uh, you know, Maybe we'll talk about this with Ken when he joins us in a few minutes. Uh, the uh, Frank piece. Um, on Mark Shifley, uh, but our friends at Manitoba Battery, we were just talking about how damn cold it's been. Uh, they have been powering Winnipeg and Manitoba through this incredible cold stretch. Uh, Manitoba Battery are the go-to guys for all battery needs here in Winnipeg and the province, and they do it at the best price. A, a locally owned business that are, uh, you know, pretty much any battery, most batteries, uh, less than $100 with Core Exchange or they'll deliver it to you anywhere in town for 115 bucks on the same day you need it, as long as you let them know 
by 1.30 p.m. And for those of you brave enough to get onto the water right now, Manitoba Battery has all the flash root batteries you need to keep you catching fish throughout the Manitoba winter. Pop down and see them at 1026 Logan Avenue. You can phone them at 783-8787 or check them out online at manitobabattery.com. Um, well, I'm just fine. Just talking to Nick is making me excited about bomber season. And of course, the uh, championship merch is still flowing over at Royal Sports. Just last week, they got four new exclusive Winnipeg Blue Bombers Grey Cup champion hats, some back-to-back -back versions as well. You can pick those up along with Rams Super Bowl championship gear and thousands and thousands of pieces of Winnipeg Jets merchandise with many exclusives for the Jets fan in the family. While you're there, check out their massive hockey section, snowboards and more fitness, summer sports, and then, of course, all the cool things over on the Kings skate, snow, and surf side. And there, Remus also popping some of those cool throwback Jets jerseys that they've got as well. Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. And uh, make sure to follow them on Instagram. Remus will show you their page right now, at Royal Sports Pemina, for all their latest merchandise drops and sales. And uh, I don't know about you, I mentioned that driving in Winnipeg was like, you know, trying to navigate the surface of the moon earlier. Um, I think it's given a lot of people thought on maybe it's time for a new whip. And if you're thinking about a new vehicle in 2022, start your search with our friends over at Not Auto Corp. Why not get into the car of your dreams at an amazing price with the help of the Not team? Check out the amazing vehicles on the lot or talk to a Not expert about the make and model that you want. They'll help get it here for you to Winnipeg at the best possible price. Not Auto Corp, Waverly and McGillivray and online over at not.ca. All right, let's get Michael Remus back in here. We do have Ken Weeb coming up in uh, just a few minutes. Um, but Remo, maybe before we get to Kenny, let's hear what Coach Lowry had to say. And there were some interesting comments on uh, the lineup changes today, update on Christian Veselainen, and what he's looking for from Evgeny Svechnikov as he seemingly gets another crack at the top six playing alongside Pierre-Luc Dubois and Kyle Connor. Here's a bit of the coach from earlier today in Dallas. I didn't chance to ask you about this before, but decision to, to send Billy to uh, to the match over moves just he needs to play, yeah. and that's and you know that's the biggest thing, and and uh, he's taken huge strides from the start of the year to uh, to where he is now, and but for him it's all about playing. It's not uh, he's not going to get any better uh, sitting in the stands watching hockey. He's not the first guy to be up with the, you know, the big club and go back for more ice time in, in the NHL level. But it seems that the constant in that is guys are never happy to go from this place to that place. How would you feel Billy's been handling, you know, that, that situation, this situation? Well, I think this year with, uh, you know, the maturity level, he, ha he has a real good understanding that, uh, you know, he, he got a, a, a very good opportunity. He got to, he got to play regular minutes. He made some mistakes and he, he got to go back out there. And the big thing and the biggest mistake that these young guys make is they think it's a race and they have to be there. And it's about development and it's about playing. And right now for him, he has to play games. With the harp on it, you mentioned development. I think a lot of people outside of this locker room go, well, his development should be at this level, but there's still lots of development opportunity where he is with the moves. He's going to play in every situation with the Moose, um, and he's and he's going to play big minutes. And it's about playing. And you can say you're going to develop here. He's not going to develop here not playing. And that and that's the whole reason right now is our back end is healthy, and uh, we need him to play. One more on him to, for me. The the idea of making mistakes and then continuing to play that was kind of an interesting <clears throat> thing because. He's so good with the puck, but he didn't start it that way for his first couple like of shifts or what have you. He continued to play. How did he handle that? Because that would be an emotional, psychological tough spot for a guy. Well, I I, I really believe that uh, you know, and we talked about his first game. He wasn't very good, and uh, he got to play the second game, and he got better, and he got a little bit more comfortable, and and he was nervous, right? And and and. You live with that with, with uh, young players. Um, you know, he'd been here before, 
Um, obviously, uh, you know, the nerves, we got through them. And, and he was a better player. And and the best part of it all is, and, and you know, like some people, he's, he was playing good hockey, and we want to make sure he continues to play good hockey. More on the day it looks from jerseys and what have you. Maybe Beaulieu is going to come in first down me and play with Schmidt. Is that right? That's correct. Same with Svechnikov into that top six, probably swapping with Brooks. That's correct. How about you started? It's nice you guys got here today early. Svechnikov, you know, obviously was on that line earlier in the season with, with, with Connor and Dubois. Is he in the doghouse, or, or how, how? You know, a lot of people wonder what the you know. It's a curious case with him, just having had success and then not in the lineup. You know, notable healthy scratch. You'd mentioned he didn't look like he was all that happy. I know it's inside the locker room. But what is the situation with him? Where is he playing today? Top minutes. It looks like a top line. Well, there you go. He gets an opportunity. Take advantage of it, right? You guys can look for angles or whatever. You know, we look for consistency and and level of play. And, you know, there's a certain way that uh, guys have to play, and there's certain expectations and standards, and that's, that's going to be for everybody. So it's an open hole there on, on that line. You know, obviously Brooks was there before. You're looking to fill that with consistency, as you mentioned. What, what are you looking for from that spot consistently? I'm looking for a guy that's going to go in and play with those guys and play the right way and complement the two players that they're playing with. You know, that's that's been what we've talked about from day one. And, and obviously we've got some good players out. So it's opportunity. Take advantage of the opportunity. That's that's what we uh, that's what we say to them every day. Speaking of generating angles, does it feel like a must win tonight? Every game's a must win. You know, we've put ourselves in this position. We know that well, we're chasing this team. So yeah, we have to do what we have to do to win a hockey game. I feel like the guys are- all right, there's Dave Lowry, Jeff Hamilton, and Marat Atesh, both boots on the ground in Dallas right now with some questions, uh, you know, some laughs from the coach that they got there early enough to do all the detective work to see who was playing tonight. <laughs> uh, but it will be Evgeny Svechnikov up in the top six. Adam Brooks moves down to the fourth line. Um, and Nate Beaulieu in on the third pairing of defense, along with Nate Schmidt replacing Logan Stanley. Let's get ready for tonight's game and talk some more Jets right now with ken weeb who is um from parts unknown today um well not necessarily unknown that looks like a uh, a wild horse maybe it is the wild horse what uh, what's going on uh Hus, good to be with you uh at the satellite office here in arizona for uh, for the start of our, our weekly segment uh, happy to be with you uh, i was hoping to have a uh you know maybe first tee backdrop or uh, you know in a perfect world we would have a, a spring training uh, field backdrop as well uh but even though it's only uh, 50 degrees fahrenheit here uh, and rain pouring rain in arizona i uh, had to go outside uh you know we're, we're rugged folks us manitobans so had to had to come outside for the hit no, knowing you, I would have expected maybe at a 19th hole somewhere, having already have had 18 holes in the bag for today before you went out to play 36. I, I would have loved to, uh, but today it was it was it was not meant to be. I guess let's say uh, it was not meant to be. And uh, earlier game today, so it would have made golf a little bit more difficult. But uh, a rare rainy day in Arizona. But uh, got a walk in to get a few steps going, but uh, no golf on the horizon uh, for at least a, a day or a couple days here. Well, and of course, a game tonight, and uh, I imagine you'll still be doing your post-game duties along with one Sean Reynolds on the uh, always enjoyable Kenny and Rennie show. The buffet will be packed tonight, I'm sure. Hey, just before we get to tonight's game, sure. um, what did you think of the weekend for the Jets? I mean, um, I don't know you guys talked about it extensively, even in case people sure. missed it. I mean, just your thoughts on, you know, the Saturday afternoon game that, you know, they didn't really do too much until the final 10 minutes, and then the... I mean, devastating way they lost in regulation to the Flames on Monday. Yeah, I mean, again, the game against Edmonton was uh, was poor. Uh, there's no way to to you know sugarcoat that. Uh, they made. You know, I would say the score was flattering to the Jets. Huss. Yes, they made a push in the last ten minutes, but uh, they were out outclassed in that game. I think that was pretty apparent. They were outskated. They were outworked. 
and uh, just did not get the job done. Uh, made it interesting, sure, but uh, a couple cl- a couple breakdowns that were very significant in the game against Calgary. I mean, uh, I mean, I understand people think that occasionally we look for silver linings, but like, let's be honest, us. That's one of the best efforts the Jets have put forth against the hottest team in the National Hockey League. So uh, we're not looking at it through rose-colored glasses. That was a devastating way to lose. Uh, unpressured turnover. I mean, those things do happen, and um, it just happened at a very inopportune time for the Winnipeg Jets, I would say. Uh, but that's what you know. Great teams find a way to win, us right? And Calgary, you know, some folks would say Calgary didn't have their best, but they found a way to get the job done. Uh, I mean, and anyone who thinks it's a sugar coating, I mean, the Jets, you know, far outchanced the Flames in terms of the high dangers in the final two periods, including five nothing in the third period. So uh, it was just a remarkable tip by Elias Lindholm, and uh, you know, co- very costly turnover, obviously, on the uh, exit that should have been clean and uh, ended up uh, in the back of the net. So, uh, you know, again, it, to use the word devastating, maybe a little bit too aggressive, but. Uh, that was definitely, uh, in, in wrestling terms, that was the unexpected shot to the solar plexus that was uh, very tough for the Jets to get back up on. But Nate Schmidt captured it perfectly, us. Uh, that's a de- you know devastating loss in some regards, but they can't let it impact these last three games of the trip or else... Uh, their tough situation could be even tougher. Today's today's a classic, right? Uh, Elliot Friedman called it the Enigma Bowl between the Winnipeg and Dallas. It's very simple. The Jets are either two points behind the Stars or they're six points behind the Stars, right? So uh, simple simple mathematics here tonight for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, they need this game to uh, get themselves kind of steady the ship, if you will. If not, uh, that uphill climb and this uh, five-game block becomes awfully challenging uh, rolling into the uh, bee's nest that is the Colorado Avalanche or Ball well, Arena or whatever they're calling it now. I'll tell you what, I stand by my description of the loss as devastating, and that wasn't sure. the shot to the solar plexus. That was a foreign object to the groin for both sure, the team sorry, and yes, the yes. fan base, Ken. Make no, make no mistake sorry, about okay, it. That was, that, was Mr., that was Mr. Saito uh, passing the salt right there. That, or Mr. Fuji, sorry, was- Fuji. Salt in the wounds is a perfect way to uh, to mention it. Um, but you, you talked about this game today. I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, this is as close to a must-win game as you can have with more than 30 games left in the season. Um, and, and, you know, the Dallas Stars, to their credit, I mean, they've had some underwhelming games. They lost to the Coyotes last week. They also went in and beat the Avalanche in Denver. And right. this is a team that, you know, has played some very tight games with the Winnipeg Jets. And, of course, they just met uh, in what some would say was, a, you know, a missed opportunity for the Jets to at least get one point after Mark Scheifele tied it in. But the bigger picture coming out of this game, Ken, going into tonight is where's the scoring gone for the Winnipeg Jets? Because, um, let's face it, you're playing against good teams. You're not going to often win, and certainly the record indicates that, only being able to put up one or two goals in a game. Yeah, it's been a challenge for them, and it's been one of the great mysteries uh, to try to decipher here. Uh, the other night when we've been talking about secondary scoring, well, Dominic Toninato was the only guy to find the back of the net, and Dominic Toninato is on a three-game point streak. Uh, that's good news for Dominic Tony Notto, but it's not good news for the Winnipeg Jets when Dominic Tony Notto is leading the offensive charge, Huss, right? So uh, that means the big guns have been kind of held in check here the last couple of games. Uh, we know Mark Scheifele came out of the break uh, on red hot fire, but three games without a point. I mean, that that that's come at a tough time for the Jets as well. Uh, you know, the back end getting a little bit more involved in the scoring the other night, but uh, they need their big guns to all be firing in order to have a chance against a lot of these teams. And they're going to have to respond uh, this evening. I mean, and that's a, uh, it's a massive, massive game, as you mentioned. I mean, it doesn't get any, any, the clarity is not any more simple than it is uh, this evening. Uh, I thought Connor Hellbuck was excellent the other day, Huss, uh, against the Calgary Flames specifically. I mean, uh, there was a barrage in the first period and things kind of went, uh, went on tilt uh uh, for a while there, but he held the minute. And I mean, again, you can't can't fault him on the game-winning goal. I mean, uh, as I said, you know, Sean Reynolds and I disagreed uh, quite, you know, quite heavily on terms of what happened. We both agreed that it was a great job by Matthew Kachuk to get to the blue paint. Uh, to me, there's no, I don't. It, yes, Dylan Demello did. There was there contact in the in the middle back. Yes, but he changed his route obviously to you know impact you know impact the impede the progress of Connor Hellebuck. Uh, I didn't think, unlike some people, that he had time to reset. For me, that's goalie interference all day long. And again, 
I'm not saying that because the goal came against the Jets. If that happened to Jacob Markstrom and it was Adam Lowry in front, I would have said the exact same thing. Uh, I thought that was goal interference, especially. And again, I get it in a tight game. You better be 100% sure. But to me, I mean, Kachuk definitely moves his shoulder to the left instead of trying to get out of the way and somehow avoid the contact. So, uh, and it, and he started in the blue paint when the contact was made. It didn't. It wasn't as though Dylan DeMello pushed him into the blue paint. So, anyways, that's not why the Jets lost. The Jets lost because they were if their inability to capitalize on their chances, tons of chances to win that hockey game. Uh, when it was one-one, they were unable to uh, foil Jacob Markstrom. And now they're back in a chase position. I mean, they were successful in their first five game block at three, one and one, uh, you know, looking at Oh, and two to start the second game block with games against Dallas and Colorado. Boy, oh boy, Huss, that's uh, you know, the, if the urgency level isn't high tonight, uh, they're going to, they're going to need the defibrillator pretty soon is what I would say. Um, no, uh, Reichel, he's out now week to week, apparently. And, you know, I know there's some people going, what are they doing? Throwing Christian Veselainen in uh, as Remus pointed out earlier, well, that's all they've got. I mean, these are the guys that they've got yeah. going into the lineup. Um, but what do you make of the opportunity of Evgeny Svechnikov getting back up with Connor and Dubois? It's been a long time since he played with those guys, and he did have some success, I would say, as a line with those guys earlier on. And he's been a guy that has been maybe characterized as been in the doghouse, if you will, at times with Coach Dave Lowry, even making him a healthy scratch at times. Yeah, no doubt. First on Reichel, Reichel had been doing an excellent job and just, you know, tough break for him. I mean, blocks that Nikita Zadorov shot in the foot or ankle or wherever it ended up being. I mean, he, you know, guts it out through the game. But, you know, you know what happens in those scenarios. You take the skate off and the uh, the uh, foot balloons and then you can't get it back into the boot. And now you're sidelined and now that glorious opportunity is going to someone else. Uh, I just want to touch in on the exchange. Obviously, I listened to it and, you know, good on Jeff and Murat for asking the questions. Uh, to me, Huss, I mean, Dave Lowry tells the media to watch practice to see what's happening. I mean, we've been watching us. And the reason why this doghouse narrative is brought forth is because it's accurate. It's an accurate depiction. You can't go from having a guy on the first line to you know, going from 12 to 15 minutes to going down to three minutes and then making him a healthy scratch. And to think that people aren't going to notice us. I mean, on a team that's you know, begging for secondary scoring, of course, that's going to stand out like a sore thumb, right? I mean, I, you know, some of it is, is I've been very clear. Svechnikov has found money. He's impressed me since day one of the pro camp that was held before training camp officially opened with his skill set. It hasn't translated into, you know, raw numbers at the NHL level with the Jets here this year. He's had some nice moments. He's had some times where he's taken some questionable penalties. The other night he got himself in trouble by getting teed up in that Edmonton game, which is never a good thing when you're battling for ice time. But right now, he's the best option the Jets have in that spot. I think he knows how glorious this opportunity can be for him. Uh, and again, it's a great change. You know the best way to change a narrative? You know the best way to go from the doghouse to the penthouse is to produce on the line with Kyle Connor and Pierre-Luc Dubois like he had been doing before. Nobody's saying uh, Svechnikov needs to go on a Patrick Line type heater. No one's saying go out and get a 10-game point streak here and, and pot 8 or 10 goals. But if he can provide consistent play, he's provided good board play. He had made a nice play the other night on the Tony Notto uh, redirection. Nice job to get it to the point. He goes to the hard areas, uh, and he's got a great shot. So we talked about this all year long. Uh, both Svechn or Svechnikov and Veselainen, we see them in practice. They go bar down with regularity. That hasn't happened often at this level. And when you get that confidence, then that's going to translate into offense. But uh, I thought Svechnikov handled the qu line of questioning well. I mean – What's the player going to say? I mean, I, I need to do a better job. If I want to keep that job, I got to play better. I mean, uh, is it disappointing to him that he got taken off the line originally back in, when we talked about it, when Blake Wheeler came back in? Of course it is. But uh, when you're in a situation where you're making the league minimum and you're trying to establish yourself in an NHL regular and you're about to play your 82nd NHL game, it's a, it's a daily grind to become a full-time player. Uh, I think, you know, he's a mentally strong individual. I expect him to take advantage of the opportunity. And quickly, Huss, I, I thought Adam Brooks for the first two periods, I thought he was pretty effective on that line. Uh, I really liked him on the second power play unit, and his puck distribution is at a very high level. I mean, there have always been questions about Adam Brooks' skating at the NHL level, but he does everything else really well. Great distributor. He can shoot the puck. I thought he meshed well with those guys, but he's barely played. So he played for, I think, 12 or 14 minutes through two periods, just ran out of gas. So, 
Uh, he'll get another opportunity down the line. But well, hey, on Brooks for a second. On Brooks for sure. a second. I mean, what does it say about how the head coach, at least in the organization, is thinking about the guys in the bottom six that they pick a dude up off waivers and he starts on arguably the top line with the top two guys all season long and Dubois and Connor in game number one before anybody that's been in the lineup. Sure. And it says two things. It says the other guys aren't doing a good enough job, but it also says it's a reinforcement. We talk all the time about, uh, you know, putting guys in positions to succeed. So Adam Brooks is an offensive player. I mean, at the NHL level, he's played mostly on the fourth line because that's the only place there was an opening for him. But this is a skilled player. It's a skilled player in the Western League where he put up 120 plus points two years in a row uh, with the Regina Pats. He's been a point of game player at the American League level, won a Calder Cup with the Toronto Marlies. The only thing it hasn't done is translated to the NHL, but even this year, right? 11 points in about 30 games. That's pretty good when you consider the minutes that he's been playing. So uh, I think it was a smart place to put him. Uh, in a lot of ways, he has some of, I mean, again, I'm not comparing these guys apples to apples here, but, you know, as an undersized player, and it was not a burner, he carries a lot of the same qualities that Cole Perfetti does. So they figured that maybe it wouldn't be much different for his line mates in terms of inserting a guy, a straight line player who has some creativity. Uh, I think that's probably part of the reason why the decision was made. But uh, I, I like the decision to go with Brooks, and I like this decision as well. And let's not kid ourselves, Hus. If it's not going well for Svechnikov, don't 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 be afraid to see the blender uh, rolling out here and seeing Adam Brooks get another chance here. And I still think that Brooks will be used on that second power play uh, unit as well. What I would also say, uh, you know, positive sign for Andrew Kopp today, uh, the fact that he's on the trip on the ice in a yellow jersey uh, after what we suspect is a head injury. You know, who knows when he'll be cleared, but uh, I expect, you know, it's possible that if, if it wasn't possible for Kopp to be returning before this trip is over, I don't think he'd be on the trip. So uh, that's a positive for the Jets. I think also Sandberg and Cease were in regular jerseys. But further to your point, I mean, if David Gustafson had to go back to the Moose, you got to expect CJ Cease is going to need to go to the minors before he sees NHL action, unless it's an absolute emergency. Yeah, indeed. Uh, what about Bolio going in over Stanley? I'll be honest, that yeah. surprised me. Yeah, it surprises me too, Us. I mean... Nathan Bolio gives you everything that he has. I think he is a uh, prototypical number seven D man. I think he's very well liked. He gives you, you know, he's a shot blocker, physical guy. He'll throw down if you need him to. But uh, to me, Huss, I think that Nathan Bolio has been passed on the depth chart. I think a good place for him is as the seventh defenseman. I mean, uh, I would just, I, I know what Stanley was on the ice. He also blocked a shot in that same sequence of Christian Reichel. I know he finished the game and I know he was on the ice, not wearing yellow. Maybe it's one of the situations where he's not quite 100%. I mean, I know David Lauer didn't mention that, but uh, I was surprised for sure. I know Billy Hanley got a lot of air time at the start of that scrum today as well. Uh, you know, personally, Huss, I, I think that, you know, Hanley, I, probably right now the best place for him is to play 22 minutes in the American League. But I think that we're not far from Billy being a regular country. And, and you know, I understand the folks that are making the argument that it could be, should be right now. But um, for me, I'm a bit surprised. I understand a veteran or a coach wanting to lean on a veteran kind of guy. Bolu has been very good on the penalty kill at times, but uh, you know it, it is one of those things that you know head scratcher might be too strong a word, but uh, I think that the Jets need to give their younger guys you know some more looks here. Um, but I understand why in a you know in a tight game that they they're choosing to go otherwise. But uh, if you're asking me if I'd rather see Vili Hanel in the lineup, uh, I think that answer would be yes right now. Just based on – here's the other part of it too, Huss. I think that the pairing of Schmidt and Stanley had some rocky moments at times. I think that Vili Hanel's uh, ability to zone exit and use his sk speed, skating ability, puck moving ability, I think all of those qualities would come in handy against a team like Dallas. I understand they're a big, strong, heavy team. Uh, but I think that, that Hanel – and Schmidt could be a pairing that you'd like to see more of. I mean, I, I would also say I, I think that the Jets uh, going away from Dylan and Schmidt uh, has also kind of hurt them at times during this stretch here. Um, Neil Pionk hasn't played at the level that we had seen him play in the first two years with the Jets. Yes, he got a nice assist the other night, but uh, something to me Huss has been off with Pionk's game since December 5th, since he stuck out the knee on Rasmus Sandin and was suspended, but also since he took the knee to the head and had the concussion. Uh, obviously, we know those are tough things to battle through. Uh, I just think that Neil hasn't played at that that level that we're used to seeing. He's not producing as much offensively. The competitive nature is still there. He's playing his behind off. 
I just think that his reads have been slightly off. And, uh, you know, I wonder if a shakeup in the pairings again might, might benefit, uh, you know, Pionk and Dylan because they've, they played well with other guys together. They've only had, uh, you know, I would say a, a more limited amount of time where they've been successful together because they're both very aggressive players. And sometimes that can lead to odd man rushes or, or players kind of slipping through the cracks defensively. Yeah. Well, uh, not a lot of time to figure it out. Uh, no, I know. better have it for tonight against the Dallas stars. Cause this is an absolutely massive hockey game. Uh, you know, as, away from tonight's game, let's talk about a couple other things in and around the jets and, you know, we've certainly been talking about Mark Shifley for a number of yep. months. I mean, when things sort of started going down and these were more conversations, I think of us that follow this team the most closely looking big picture beyond this season, if things don't go well and you know how Kevin Chevalier might handle things. It's interesting. Now there's some people outside of the market talking about Mark Shifley. But Remus, if you can, let's fire off this clip from, uh, from our pal Frank Cervelli on the uh, the DFO rundown, I believe, from Friday's show um, uh, about Mark Shifley, and then we'll talk about it. There are lots of rumblings about this being Mark Shifley's last season in Winnipeg. I think it's probably premature, although not guaranteed that he's a deadline conversation. And I think this summer... They have like they have to do something too. Like, and I know that that's not in their mo. Um, they've minute. built and spent a lot of money on this core. They've had a lot of success. This is a down year, but I just there's rumblings in a sense that you know that situation is coming to a head. What that means, don't know. Um, I've asked questions, and the response I got was. Kevin Cheveldayoff has spent so much time trying to get Shifley and Pierre-Luc Dubois that now that he has them, he, he's not giving up on them that quickly. But this is a rough year for Winnipeg, and they, it feels like they might be close to turning the corner. And it's every time that they've had that sense this year, it's gone the other way kind of quickly. So we'll see if they can make a run. Well, and it was... There's uh, there's Frank Saravelli, and that end was somewhat prophetic because, of course, this was on Friday, coming off back-to-back -back wins, and as Frank called it, every time it seems like things are going well, you come up with a game like Saturday against the Edmonton Oilers, and then, of course, the uh, the loss on Friday. I mean, uh, Ken, just you just heard that. I mean, well, what do you make of what Frank's saying? And um, you know, the um, the Shifley situation for the club and for the general manager. Um, you know, potentially at the trade deadline, which is not something anyone could have imagined a few months ago. But here we are, if things don't turn around quickly. I mean, all of a sudden, it sounds like it's something that is being at least talked about. Well, Hussey, you got to put the Nostradamus hat on uh, because you were ahead of the curve on this one for sure. Uh, I, you know, we always try to play connect the dots, Huss. Uh, I mean, Mark's a guy who exhibits a lot of joy around the rink. Uh, I think that that joy level has uh, has been waning uh, to a certain degree. I don't know exactly why that is. I mean, COVID's been hard on everyone, but uh, I would say that I agree with Frank in that I don't think that it's a move that's imminent. I think it's a much uh, more likely scenario that this happens around draft time. But I mean, the calls are being made, and you know, when a when when a top center becomes available, and you know. People can say whatever they want. It's a down year for Mark Shifley based on five consecutive years of being a point-of-game player, but he's not that far off from being one. Uh, this is still an elite, high-level player, especially when it comes to his offensive game. If a player like that becomes available, there's going to be a bidding war for his services. Uh, I don't think for one second it was an accident that Pierre Dorian uh, was uh, parked in the press box for multiple games last week uh, because – I'm pretty sure that the Ottawa Senators would like a number one center to play aside Brady Kachuk, uh, even though we know they've got a lot of young talent in there, uh, whether it be uh, Josh Norris or Shane Pinto, Drake Batherson, uh, all of these kind of guys. But uh, I mean, could Ottawa be interested in Mark Shifley? Of course. I would say there's probably 20 plus teams interested in Mark Shifley, uh, you know, but for the for the real high end contenders, it's tough to add a six million dollars salary hus. So unless you're a team, I look back to 2015. Unless you're a team like Buffalo, who's not playing for this season, it's hard to add a six million dollar player. So um, I mean, it, may, it just to me, it just limits the field a little bit if a move is made at the deadline. 
Uh, there have also been some stretches where Mark has been dominant uh, coming out of the break, right? 11 points in five games. So uh, when you see him playing at that level, if you're Kevin Sheveldayoff, you would not be in any rush to move him out the door because of what you projected with Pierre-Luc Dubois and Mark Scheifele being 1-2 down the middle. So uh, I would say that teams would now be expressing some interest. If Kevin Sheveldayoff gets blown away by an offer at the deadline, Huss, would he have to consider listening? Yes, but uh, to me, it reminds me, you know, where before, I, I don't think this is anywhere near the point of no return, but I do think there would be some difficult conversations to be had, whether that's with Mark Scheifele and, and Kevin Sheveldayoff or uh, representation or, or whatever else. And Huss, the big thing is this team has to decide what direction they're going. Uh, if they want, I mean, Mark Scheifele for a long time has been part of the solution. If they want to keep him as part of the solution, then I think that some hard, diff difficult conversations need to be had. Uh, on the flip side, if Mark gets to the point where he thinks that there it's time for a change and that he needs a fresh start, well, Winnipeg is, you know, basically would be obligated to try to get the most that they can for his services. I mean, would that be a landmark kind of move? Of course it would. Mark Mark Scheifele is the first ever draft pick of this organization. He's a foundational piece who's been very productive. So I think you have to tread lightly when it comes to those kind of scenarios. But if the Jets are looking at changing the composition of the roster, we're not expecting them to move Nikolai Ehlers or Kyle Connor. We know they want to sign Dubois long term. So, I mean, now you're moving yourself down the list. And, I mean, Mark Scheifele would be a guy who would fetch a, a significant return. So, I mean, could that be in play? Of course, but uh, I, I don't think for a second Kevin Sheveldayoff's hanging out the for sale sign, and he's certainly not calling teams begging them to take Mark Shifley off his <laughs> hands. Because the other part has too, and you've talked about this, even though Shifley's still having a pretty good year, you're selling low on Mark Shifley right now, right? He, you're not selling him at his peak. So, I mean, that means you have to have a team invested in believing that he can be a 90 to 100 point player, which is what we kind of projected he would be going into this season. Yeah, and listen, he's done it before. He's scored at a very elite level. Just questions about, you know, the 200-foot game and, you know, different you know, teams will have different opinions on, on the player. But I am interested in, and this is kind of why we, you know, began talking about this. I mean, the original concept was if this season doesn't go well and they realize that, you know, Chifley's not a guy that's going to be, you know, they're going to give 10 mil a year for a second contract and keep right. him here. You know, it's such a valuable asset. The fact that this season has gone the way that it has, I think, is the only reason why this conversation is happening now and maybe not down the road around when you talked about. But a player on his tab, and we can talk about $6 million player, but I mean, many, you, know, you look at the production that he's given just offensively, it's far in excess of what $6 million normally gets you on the open market. Two years, but the extra playoff year this year, Ken, I mean, how much more might that get a general manager like Kevin Chevalier in that situation, as opposed to waiting to the off season with still two years left on a very good value contract. Yeah, it's a great point. And so let's look no further than what Tyler Tapoli was worth for three playoff seasons. Huss, right. So a guy with two more years of term, uh, Brad Treleving to me made a very good deal for a team that's contending and trying to win the Stanley cup, but he still gave up a significant amount to get him. Now, the difference I would say Huss in the two situations is to me, the Jets have to be looking at players rather than future assets or 100%. prospects. So that would be the difference right away to me. Um, you know, again, so this is, well, let's just, uh, you know, we're trying to think on my feet here. But so we looked at Ottawa. If you're the Jets and you're making a deal with Ottawa, hypothetically speaking, you need to get uh, Shane, you know, Shane Pinto back plus something else, plus a prospect, plus a drop. You know what I mean? Like you need to get someone that's going to help you immediately, but also – Try to if the whole premise of what you talked about. If the Jets are trying to extend their window beyond just the two years after, when you have expiring contracts for contracts for Shifley, Wheeler, and Ellibuck, that's how you do that by bringing in players who are ready to compete. But you also have team control over for a significant amount of time. Um, so to me, I mean, that's something they have to consider whether it's with Shifley or more likely when we're and we've talked about this for weeks now. When you're talking about Paul Stastny and Andrew Kopp, I mean, you know, one of the names this week that's been, you know, front and center with, uh, you know, Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick. So Owen Tippett would be a guy, to me, if I'm Kevin Sheveldayoff, that's the guy I want from the Florida Panthers. Let, let's just say hypothetically that the Panthers are one of the teams calling on Andrew Kopp. I mean, I know fans are saying, well, get a first round pick. Well, no, to me, get a guy who is a, you know, 11th overall pick 
that six foot one, 200 plus pounds is a right hand shot power forward that can score, but who hasn't found his game yet, right? So we, Sean and I talked about Josh Anderson the other day. You're not going to go get Josh Anderson because he costs too much. Go and find the next Josh Anderson, right? A guy that's a power forward in that kind of a body. Uh, and a frame that can score. So, we, we're not thinking that cop on the open market at the deadline could actually fetch fetch a first, are we? I, I don't. Well, it's a, all it takes is one team to be in the bidding for him. I mean, it, 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 I understand that's where you're coming from. It's much more likely to be a Zuccarello type of trade, right? It's a you know middle six forward. That's often two seconds. I mean, you would need a team to want to kind of outbid the other. But I mean, to me, I think that. Even then, I mean, I'd much rather have Owen Tippett than two seconds because Owen Tippett should be able to help you right now, and he's under team control for a what much wider window, whereas the first-round pick's probably not helping you until two or three years down the road because it's probably, you know, 28th to 32nd if you're the Florida Panthers uh, based on where well, they are. You know, what you're saying I think is really important, and I think people need to know that, certainly from where I'm sitting here. I mean, if they're whatever they're considering about deals, yeah. I still do think that they have the confidence in the majority of this group for the right. next couple seasons, you know, to be there. So, I mean, trading any of these players, now listen, if you're just selling off an asset that you're going to lose at the end of the season, sure, get your picks, I'll get whatever you can get. But if we're talking about any sort of other trade of a core piece, to me, it's not at all about picks and prospects. Maybe that's something that gets added and sweetened to it. But I mean, any sort of a deal will be made with the next two seasons in mind to how you change the chemistry of the team, the makeup. But make no mistake about it. A lot of people rag on Shif for some of the things that, you know, he has and hasn't done. The minute he walks out of your dressing room, you have a massive hole to fill that in all likelihood, one single player isn't going to be doing it. And the the concept behind it would, it would make your team overall better, but certainly would put a lot more pressure on the shoulders of Pierre-Luc Dubois, who would seemingly be the clear-cut number one center. And you wouldn't have the one-two um, center t- uh, depth right now that the Jets have in their top six. Yeah, no doubt about that, Hassan. And that's why I say you better be careful what you wish for uh, in some regards. And yes, are there some flaws in the defensive side? Yes, but you can find those on a lot of high-end uh, offensive players around the National Hockey League. Uh, and I think, too, we talked about the Calgary Flames. I mean, the Calgary Flames last year wanted to drive Johnny Goudreau to the airport and find him his next destination. Now Johnny Goudreau is on pace for 110 points, and he's a legitimate MVP candidate. So uh, sometimes you got to be careful in terms of how you're valuing things. I mean, there too, Sean Monaghan wasn't viewed as a number one in quotation center for the Calgary Flames, even though he'd been a consistent 30 goal guy. Well, you know who's a consistent 30 goal guy or 28 to 32? Mark Shifley with probably the potential to be a 40 plus guy uh, if he well, if he wasn't such a good passer or wasn't a guy who would like to use his vision. So 80 points, you know, 80 point guys are hard to find. And that's why you don't see them on the move very often, us, but uh, you know, if there's a significant return, you you know, your ears are open because, you know, there are some big decisions ahead. But to me, I'd, I'd say I'd be a little bit I, – I would I would put the over under uh, in terms of a Shifley trade before the deadline at probably 25% or lower on the cool bet lines. Yes, well, we'll get to the cool bet lines a little bit <laughs> later on. Uh, what's uh, what's on the buffet tonight at uh, the, uh, the K&R smorgasbord post-game? Uh, should be good. I mean, whatever the game brings us, we'll uh, we'll be heading to the buffet. I don't think we'll have any lobster tails or uh, crab legs in there tonight, but uh, we'll be digging in as deep as we certainly can, Huss, and uh, should be another, uh, I would imagine it'll be a, a highly emotional night. Uh, I would say that it, there certainly was on the weekend, and uh, I know you talked about it with other guys, but uh, great to see Brian Little in the building. I mean, that's oh, yeah. the other part, too. We talked about, you know, the, if, if the Jets are considering uh, Mark Shifley at some point, I mean, uh, for a long time, Brian Little had to hear all about the, well, there's no number one center. And, you know, having Mark Scheifele and Brian Little as a one-two punch ended up being pretty good for the Winnipeg Jets uh, for a very long time. But uh, good to see him in full health and, uh, you know, great to see him around the rink and great to see him get that ovation. I think that the Jets will bring back Brian Little for a much more elaborate ceremony. But it was great to hear the roar uh, for a p- person who is very much appreciated in this market uh, for a very long time. So. Uh, you know, good to see him and good to see him in good health. I had a chance to speak briefly with him in the hallway. Uh, it seems like he's doing well health wise, but still, you know, he hasn't been cleared to play, which I mean, again, would be the toughest thing for a guy like Brian Little to deal with. Get your wake ups ready for tonight, both for the uh, people that are listening as well as Rennie for uh, when things get going tonight. Afterwards. Exactly. Looking forward to the program. Uh, have a nice trip and uh, we'll talk to you when you get back. 
Thanks. Great to be with you. And uh, one final shout out, uh, salute to Derek Taylor. Uh, great choice there by uh, CJOB is the next uh, voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. A great, uh, great guy with great local ties. And uh, I'm sure he'll do an excellent job uh, stepping into those uh, big shoes to fill. Yeah, CFL free agency just keeps on getting crazier. Eh? Look at this. Even the play-by-play guys are moving spots. Hey, have a good one, dude. Thanks for doing this. You too. Thanks for having me. Cheers, my man. Take care. All right. Uh, make sure to check out Kenny and Rennie on uh, the YouTube channel after tonight's game. Jets and Dallas dropping the puck before they move on to Denver and Arizona on this road trip. Um, hey, a big thanks to our friends at Little Brown Jug. With it being so damn cold out right now, you probably don't want to leave the house. That's okay. You can get the great taste of 1919, the Brute IPA, the Double, the Winter Variety Pack, delivered directly to your door by ordering online at littlebrownjug.ca. If you are bold enough to go out, you'll find the 1919 and find bars and restaurants throughout the city at your local favorite brew, uh, beer store. Or if you're in the Exchange District, uh, make sure to pop by Little Brown Jug HQ, the brewery and tap room. Enjoy a couple pints and pick up all their great products and some great merch as well down on William Avenue. Briar getting going next week. We'll be doing more Princess Auto Curling reports for the Canadian Men's Championship. Looking forward to that. Of course, uh, Princess Auto pulling for Team Manitoba. Mike McEwen and the Buffalo Boys, proud sponsors of, are probably sponsored by Princess Auto, where, of course, in addition to supporting curling coast to coast, it's the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop down and see them at one of two Winnipeg locations. Of course, family-owned national headquarters right here in Winnipeg as well. But you can get shopping 24-7, 365 over at princessauto.com. Um, and hey, tonight, if you are bold enough to get outside, why not pop by your local Boston Pizza? Of course, uh, the big game on the big screen with full sound. And uh, many of the local Boston Pizzas doing the Jets Pick a Player Contest where you can win some great prizes when your player scores. Pop down your local BP, and if you're staying at home tonight, hit them up online, bostonpizza.com, and get those gourmet pizzas, Boston's wings, and more delivered hot and ready to your door for game time. All right, great stuff with Ken. Uh, and Nick Dembski was a blast to have on the program, but I'm really looking forward to this next conversation. It's been a minute since we've had Reed Fowler at DraftKings on, but you know, and often we'll focus more in on golf as hockey season sort of gets done. But man, there is so much going on in the world of the PGA Tour with the Saudi League, Phil Mickelson's statement yesterday, uh, and of course the Honda Classic coming up on the weekend. We thought, what a great time to welcome Reed back to Winnipeg Sports Talk. And uh Reed Fowler joins us now. Reed, what's good, man? How are you doing? Honestly, I'm a long time no talk. Uh, thank you for having me back. It's been great. It's been busy. Uh, it feels like there is no off season to golf, especially when uh, there is literally no off season, and you get things that are outside the normal purview of what you do, which is like you just mentioned, the Saudi Golf League, Nicholson's comments, and Alan Shipnuck, and. When you talk about all the things that go along with being a good journalist and there's so many different deviations of the conversation that we can have. So I appreciate being on. No doubt. About it. Hey, before we get into all that, I mean, uh, you continue to be one of the busiest dudes in the biz. I mean, obviously your work with DraftKings, doing a bunch of the broadcast, fill people in. It was always we had great chats beforehand. You became very quickly, very popular on the program. And I yeah. get tweets all the time. Hey, there's Reed on the broadcast. I mean, fill people in on what you're up to. Yeah, so uh, I'm on. So what you're talking about is PGA Tour Live. So they had that uh, the partnership with ESPN Plus, and now there's more coverage, which is exactly what all of us golf fans want, right? We just want to see more golf. And so I've worked with PGA Tour Live before for a handful of tournaments before the ESPN Plus coverage, but now with the feature holes, featured groups, marquee groups, and the main feed, there's more work to be had. So uh, getting a chance to be uh, part of this, a, a, a dream to realize, Huss, when you talk about calling golf. I know it doesn't seem as glamorous to a lot of people, like you're just calling golf. But as a fan, ever since I was a kid, it's something that is is such a, it's such a joy. Um, and being able to work with some really, really cool people and for a brand like PGA Tour Live and ESPN, it's a dream come true. So the next time, and actually I haven't told anybody this, so this is breaking. Um, I'll be at the match play. The WGC match play is the next time I'll be on PJ Tour Live. So hopefully your fans can uh, can tune in. Well, I certainly will be. That's great. And congratulations on all of that. All right. I mean, listen, the tour's underway. We've had some yeah. great results. But the biggest story in golf and one of the biggest stories in sports over mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks has been, you know, the growing mumblings that this Saudi Golf League was going to happen. 
Um, some of the biggest names were reported to be part of it. Dustin yep. Johnson, Bryson DeChambeau, and of course, Phil Mickelson. In the past week, both Bryson and DJ have said that, you know, they're committed to the PGA Tour. The Phil situation has been very, very different. I mean, if you could give our listeners that maybe haven't been following yeah. us a little primer about what this tour is and why it has been so incredibly controversial, and then we'll get to Phil. Well, yeah, outside of just the, the you know, the social aspect of, of Saudi Arabia and, and, and just, you know, what that entails for a lot of people, you start talking about a rival golf league, any rival sports league, you know, it's you start to bifurcate a product which is good for us, right? So going back, before I even get to that, like going back to what the Saudi Golf League is, it would be a lot of what the PGA Tour isn't, right? And this is what Phil has mentioned in his excerpts. This is what we've all kind of gleaned as much as possible without knowing any specifics, that it would be much more player-centric. Uh, the schedules would be controlled. They would get appearance fees. So it'd be sort of like a full-time job for, for, you know, for athletes, especially independent contractors like golfers. They'd be getting paid um, you know, much more consistently, especially those that would have gone, right? The guys who aren't the top 5, 10, 25 in the world that don't have these sponsorship, uh, you know, the, these massive sponsorship deals. Um, that's what would have allowed them to have a little bit more of a concrete schedule and a payment, so to speak. And then the, the purses, the winnings would be much higher. And they would have courses, they would have tournaments in the States, but obviously it would, a lot of it would be overseas. And like Phil was mentioning, you know, 20, 20 odd players were going to make the jump from the PGA Tour to the Saudi Golf League. And it was a, a lot of the allure was that, right? You have ownership of your own stuff. And especially when that, when that article came out, like the big thing was media rights for their own, like for the players to get their own media rights. The PGA Tour owns that. So when you take a step back and look at what this would have done to the tour, I think the biggest losers are the fans is that any competition to the NFL or the XFL, but now they're in a partnership, right? With anything that is rivaling a, a big sports club or a big sports organization, that's going to give us as fans competition to give us the best product you know, available. And the PGA Tour, like anything, needs to evolve, needs to improve. I think Phil was trying to do that. And once he said the words that he did, everyone stepped back and said, you know what, this is actually not the best course of action. And it kind of feels like Phil's on an island by himself now. Well, and of course, this quote that Phil uh, Mickelson's been attributed to saying to Alan Shipnick, who's been working on a, a book on Phil, yeah. is this. And this is about, you know, the Saudis and this regime that would be, you know, financing this rival tour. Um, they killed Washington Post reporter and U.S. resident Jamal Khashoggi and have a horrible record on human rights, Mickelson continued, in an interview that Shipnick said took place in November. They execute people over there for being gay. Knowing all of this, why would I even consider it? Because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to reshape how the PGA Tour operates. How damaging was that single quote to, frankly, the tour, this proposed tour, but also to Phil Mickelson, one of the most legendary players in the history mm -hmm. of the game, one of the most popular players in the game, uh, but someone that over the years has rubbed some people the wrong way. Yeah, and that's the big thing, right, is that when you talk about Phil Mickelson as a person, he's not just talented as a, as, a, as a golfer. He's someone who's not been void of controversy in his career, right? It's kind of He's kind of been this maverick, needs to be, right, from all intents and purposes of just reading these articles, not knowing him personally, needs to be the smartest guy in the room. And if that is, and even his wife, Amy, mentions that he has an you know obsessive compulsive personality where he needs to be known and needs to be seen as the smartest guy in the room. So people close to Phil, right, are mentioning these personality traits about him. I don't think, and this is weird to say, right, Huss, that I don't think this damages Phil because people who love Phil already know this about him, right? It's not like something that, oh my God, this is something completely different. Maybe it's the casual fan that's only seen Phil in this, you know, on social media, on these commercials, winning the PGA Championship. Maybe it comes as a surprise to them, but to the people who've been following Phil since the early 90s, even back before that, when he was a rookie, he hasn't been without controversy. He's been this type of guy, and we know that his biggest thing is, is collecting as much money as possible. This guy just loves to make a ton of money, and that's the allure. That was the carrot at the end of the stick for Phil. So I don't think 
these are damaging words. Don't get me wrong. These are things that you should not be, you know, attributed to being in cahoots with. But for Phil Mickelson and the people who love him, I don't know if it's as damaging as they think because Phil has always been this way. Well, it has been damaging in some ways. And you mentioned the money. I mean, it's already costing him a lot. His longtime yep. sponsor, KPMG, has walked away. Amstel Light has walked away. We all remember those ads uh, that Phil's done. And I mean, he has been, you know, an industry almost on his own mm -hmm. outside of Tiger Woods. I mean, the next guy up really has been Phil Mickelson. Yep. Um, and, and this is all in the aftermath of his, this, uh, statement that he put out yesterday via Twitter, which very interestingly was literally tweeted out at the exact time the PGA Tour players and management were meeting at the same time. Read into that for what it's worth. Um, but what did you make of the statement, what he said or didn't say, and the reaction from some of his longest, most loyal sponsors that have walked away from the Mickelson brand? Yeah, I mean, the sponsors, you kind of saw that coming, right? Once you see these, like that, that doesn't come without consequence. And businesses have to be business. They're not going to tie themselves to someone who's in the face of all the things that he said, still going to do it, right? So that's not like someone, like that's not like he doesn't know, right? When people get get caught with performance enhancing PEDs, they're like, I don't know what I put on my body. Like Phil knew exactly what he was doing, right? And, and in spite of that, um, and also, we'll say this though, so like KPMG and these sponsors didn't like they. This not like out that like out of left field. Like they knew what he was doing as well. So if it worked, right, then you could, like that's a that's for a show maybe after hours, right, Huss of of like <laughs> okay, let's talk about that kind of stuff. But going back to to what you were saying about his his mea culpa of sorts, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things too where like you said some pretty damaging stuff. Is this a re repair your image then to walk away and come back after, you know, six months or whatever it is where people kind of forget, like yeah, that becomes yesterday's news? It kind of felt like that, right? It kind of felt like that because if he has disdain for the PGA Tour and how it operates, there's better ways to do it than to like publicly call out the PGA Tour and support you know, people who potentially are anti what everybody else in terms of human rights believes in. So I like you kind of appreciate it. You know, I'm not I'm not a big person in, in cancel culture. Uh, people who do damaging things to society need to be taken away in, in terms of, hey, maybe you just need to be away from the situation for a long period of time, get some real help, professional help. By the same time, Phil is going to learn from this. Hopefully he does. And, you know, he, do he doesn't make this mistake again because it's not something that you want to keep on rehashing. Reed Fowler with us here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. The final couple um, lines of his um, statement, and you just go to his, uh, his Twitter feed as a blue check mark, you'll, you'll see the piece. Um, he said, the, the, the past 10 years, I felt the pressure and stress slowly affecting me at a deeper level. I know I have not been my best and desperately need some time away to prioritize the ones I love most and work on the man that I want to be. Whatever that means, uh, it does mean that he's going to be taking a bit of time away. Uh, what are you hearing? I mean, when is the next time we'll see Phil teeing it up on tour? Or maybe is it more somewhere like the Masters, um, which is outside of the guise of the PGA Tour? Yeah, I don't know if I, I don't know if we see him in the Masters. Uh, to be honest, I, it would be Phil to kind of make make that his his goal is to be at Augusta, a place that he absolutely adores. Uh, but if he, if this is true, it kind of feels like you know this sort of when DJ walked away, right? Not for the same reasons at all, completely different. But it kind of feels like that, where this is an indefinite time away to work on yourselves. And look, DJ was better for it. And I think this is what Shipnuck says when it, like he had another piece about an Ask Me Anything. And it kind of mentioned the same thing where it kind of feels, and I agree with that, right, is going to be some time away because, again, you're talking about the PGA Tour. Like, he's made some enemies, right? He has now made some enemies on the PGA Tour, his fellow playing, you know, peers on the PGA Tour, the players, right? Maybe even the Saudi League. He, I mean, he publicly called them out on the stuff that they don't want to talk about. And so he's potentially making some enemies right now where he needs to be out of the public eye. Having said that, Phil is a guy who loves to be right, you know, snapped out in the middle, right, of the public eye. So I'd say the Masters is probably the earliest, but I think it's after that, Huss. I don't, I don't think we see him for a while. Well, you know, you made the comparison to DJ. And, I mean, DJ famously took some time off to work with personal issues. But, I mean, you know, most people that follow it closely believe that he was actually suspended. And they didn't just come out straight and say that he was suspended. Yep. 
for testing positive for let's just call them recreational uh, recreational drugs. Uh, like, is Phil? Could Phil be suspended? And and if he was, would we know about it, or would this be? Hey, I'm just taking some time away. I'll let yeah. you know when I'm coming back. So the answer to the first is potentially, and the answer to the second is no way. Right, because if the PJ Tour suspended Phil, that would play exactly into what Phil is complaining about. Right, is that the PGA Tour is so out of touch that any sort of d- dissenting thought is going to be, you know, taken away. You know, is going to be, oh, you're suspended. We don't want to hear from it. Right, when competition and dissenting thoughts and the the, the movers and the shakers of society that get, that can speak different to a topic, right, wrong, or indifferent, move and evolve the society forward. Right, and that's what Phil is doing. Look, Phil, for better or worse, right, Phil, and the tactics, the execution was was terrible in my opinion, but the outcome is exactly, is potentially what he wants. Like the PGA Tour is infusing a ton of money to the players now because of the potential of this competing tour or other competing tours in the future happening, you know, coming up, uh, you know, coming into fruition. I don't think this is the last time we see a competing tour with with the PGA, right? Because there's so much money to be had. And because of that, there's going to be people in business and operators who want a piece of that. The PGA Tour wants it all for themselves. It makes a ton of sense. So the execution, poor. I don't like it one bit, but the, the the outcome is what you're potentially getting at, which is getting more money to the massive amounts, the, you know, the sort of quote unquote middle class of the PGA professional, not the upper echelon, who's maybe not making as much money. Uh, Reed Fowler, well, um, I got to ask you just before we hit the Honda, um, is this Saudi league right now dead in the water? Will it still go ahead? I mean, you know, a lot of the players that I think were supposed to be the guys that would be the the flagship marquee names yeah. uh, are bowing out right now. I mean, uh, oh, how do you see this going forward or does it? Yeah, I think it is. I think you'll see a lot of guys that were coming out that had rumored to go right. Poulter, Adam Scott, some of these players kind of retrace <laughs> And say, hey, look, yeah, like it was enticing. You got to do your due diligence. But the PGA Tour is what I love. I think it is for now. Right? I, I don't think it's going to, especially when you don't have the players and the talent. Like that, that's it, right? You, you don't have Bryson. You don't have DJ. You don't have like Phil's not going to. Phil's going to be the only guy playing on the tour, basically. So I think that yeah, this is probably dead uh, until further notice. Yeah, it totally reminds me. I don't know how much international soccer you follow, but I mean, when the premiership teams yeah. and the big teams in Spain were all coming together and hey, we're going to make this Super League and walk away and the public backlash was so heavy. Then a bunch of the teams were going, whoa, wait a second. We weren't really in. We were just exactly. talking to them about it. And, you yeah. know, then immediately just tried to put it in the rear view and going forward. Um, there will be golf be played this week. A number of the guys we've talked about won't be in the field. Honda Classic, Sanjay in the favorite, a former winner of this event. I mean, when you have the top 10 players all playing at Riv last week, you know you probably won't get that again this week. But uh, well, when you look at the board, uh, who's uh, who's catching your eye heading into Thursday's tee-off? Yeah, objectively, from a statistical standpoint, Sanjay is the best player, not just because he's won here before, but you take a look at what he's done tee to green. It's fantastic over the last two dozen rounds. He can gain strokes around the green. That's not exactly what you want because that means that you're not getting it on the green if you're gaining strokes around it. Uh, but these these greens are hard. This course is hard. It's not going to be as windy as historically it's been here. But still, this is a Florida course. It plays extremely tough. It's a par 70. There's water essentially everywhere. Um, but Sanjay is, again, I wouldn't knock anybody for wanting to play Sanjay. I don't think I'd bet him at, that, at his number currently uh, or – I'd probably play him more on, on ZFS lineup as opposed to betting him out right. But it's the guy right next to him is Louis Oosthuizen. Depending on where you got him in the board, maybe it was early in the week at plus 2,500 here in the States, 25, 28 to 1, probably 25 to 1 everywhere else. Um, that's the one guy that I'm, I'm honing in on. Even though he hasn't won on tour, which is so weird. It's so weird that he hasn't <laughs> won. Well, he hasn't won on American soil. Right, he's won a a, a a tournament, a major, obviously in the PGA Tour schedule, but he hasn't won on U.S. soil. I like him quite a bit, and I'm actually going full South Africans here with Christian Bezetino as the other as another guy that I like. Missed the cut last week, but he's first in strokes game putting on Bermuda grass. Really good with his approach, so I like Louis and I like Cebes just as my uh, two guys that I'm probably going to be most heavy on, both in DFS and betting. 
you know, I have to admit, and I mean, I'm a sucker for Brooks. I mean, I always think yeah. that he's going to be popping out. But I mean, at 22 to one in this field, I mean, yeah. it pretty much is an auto bet. And I mean, I've seen the numbers right now. He's the biggest liability to just about every casino or every sports book <laughs> yeah. right now. But where's Brooks game at right now? And I mean, uh, yeah. did you like him at a 22 to one number considering the rest of this field? Yeah, of course. I mean, there's some places you can get him at 25, I think. Over at DK Sportsbook, he's right at that number at two. Maybe he's a little less right now just because of that. Um, yeah, I mean, you, at what point does Brooks Kepka become an auto bet, right? I think this is probably it at this number, right? And, like, he's, I think, 16 to 1 to win the Masters, right? And if now he's, in some books, 18 to 1 and this field with none of the top 10 guys, a short par 70, of course he's played well at. Now he gets back to Florida on Bermuda grass, all the stuff that he likes – it kind of feels like Brooks could run away with this. And you don't need mine. You don't need 23 under. You need eight under, right? That's probably going to win this. Eight under, 10 under. And Brooks, if he shoots two or three under a day and doesn't, you know, get those huge numbers, then he's going to be well within reason of winning this golf tournament. So, yeah, of course, Brooks Kapka, the game has shown in like different spots, us like different tournaments or different rounds at different courses. He hasn't put everything together yet. That could be this week. And wouldn't you be kicking yourself if you had a Brooks with the two in front of his name and you didn't bet it in this field and you won? Yeah, I'm with you on that. So yeah, it, it, did, it didn't take long to know where I was putting that first click when we were getting after it. <laughs> uh, Reed, thanks so much for doing this. I can't wait to uh, catch up with you throughout the golf season. Continued success. Congrats on uh, everything you're doing with PGA Tour Live and, of course, all the great content you're cranking out with our friends over at DraftKings. All right, thanks, bud. Take care. Appreciate it. Give him a follow on Twitter, folks, at Reed T. Fowler. That's Reed Fowler. And, of course, you can catch him on many PGA Tour live broadcasts throughout the year. Coming up next at the WGC match play. We still do. I do want to get to Patrick Liney. We have not forgotten about Patrick Liney. We will be getting to him in just a moment. Um, but a, uh, well, you know, maybe he's had the new Red Velvet Blizzard from our friends over at DQ because something's gotten into Liney because he is on an absolute heater right now. Um, you know, the blizzards are still cold, but the burgers are hot. So many great things over at our friends, Nick and Nikki DQ, the red velvet blizzard featured right now. And of course, all the incredible new burgers at DQ, new buns, sauces, and more. You can find out more on their website online with all the, uh, all the new offerings. Check out the Steakhouse burger. Absolutely elite. Um, but when you do, make sure you pop by one of the four Nick and Nicky DQs to support them who've supported us so well. DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. And of course, if you need an ice cream cake from Nick and Nicky for uh, an upcoming event, you can hit them up on Insta at DQ Manitoba. Let them know what you're looking for. They'll get a custom made ready for you to go quick and easy pickup at any of the four Nick and Nicky DQs. And uh Hey, you know what? Sometimes we joke that this team is driving us to drink. Well, if you're going to have a drink, make it the best. Make it Canadian Club, official sponsor of Winnipeg Sports Talk, and, of course, your Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And for the month of February, amazing savings at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts on Canadian Club. Look for the CC display with sale pricing on Canadian Club Original, Canadian Club 100% Rye, and Canadian Club 12-Year Reserve right now at your local Manitoba Liquor Mart. And make sure to join us on Friday afternoon for another week-ending Winnipeg Sports Talk Marble Race. And uh, we've got some more great hoodies. WST collab with Canadian Club, our great sponsors. So we'll see you on Friday for that. And cheers to our friends at Canadian Club. We will get to the cool bet lines before the end of the program. Uh, but let's get Remus back in here. I do want to talk to him about Patrick Liney, as well as um, just a great run today, Remus. This has been a really, really fun show. Nick Dembski was awesome. Always fun talking to Kenny Weeb. And uh, man, I really, it was a great chat with Reed Fowler on a story that, you know, even if you aren't a big golf fan per se, you know about Phil Mickelson. And I've always been fascinated at the business side of sports. It, it was such a huge factor um, in so many things that fans end up dealing with. And I'll tell you what, this uh, story about the Saudi Golf League has been uh, the story in the PJ Tour lately, and it got pretty crazy over the past week. I'm muted. Some interesting comments from Phil Mickelson here, Huss. Um, I see a lot of people confused in chat. I think. You know, it's just the fact that he even considered, um, you know, taking that opportunity uh, despite 
the human rights violations that he mentioned. So I just want to uh, mention, mention it's that. It's a but, tough look for Phil. A very, very yeah. tough look for Phil. And, so, and the more, I mean, I spent like a good portion of last night reading a bunch of the latest articles. And certainly the AMA with Alan Shipnuck today was quite telling as well. He's been writing the book on Phil. Uh, and uh, But one, once I realized that KPMG and Amstel Light had walked away from Phil, um, that that kind of spoke to the seriousness of the situation and how it's being viewed by people in the golf world. And, uh, I, I, you know, in some ways I think Phil bit off way more than he can chew in this case. And it'll be fascinating to see what becomes of his season and his future now over 50 years old, you know, having that incredible win last year is the oldest major winner of all time. And now being somewhat of a pariah in a sport that he's been such a big part of building. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll have to wait and see how this uh, moves forward here on the PGA Tour. But we did have some hockey stuff we wanted to get back to. Uh, Patrick Line, I kind of touched on it off the start. Um, he is on a absolute heater. What and is it, 12 goals in nine games? The shots looking good. I don't have the exact numbers. I know he scored two yesterday. And, you know, you guys were talking about the 20 that was set for the over-under here. And what is he at now? Eight. 18, 18 so yeah we I mean, might be cashing those tickets by the weekend i mean at the rate that he's going on right now and you know what's interesting and this i'll be surprised to see people in the chat you know fill us in on your thoughts on this you know that trade was incredibly controversial for a number of reasons but one of the biggest reasons is that you know you very rarely have the opportunity to draft a player of Mbaini's pedigree at number two overall. When you come in and start your career the way that he did with what, 36 goals and then 44 goals and then 18 goals in a month in the next season, um, you know, I think most people thought that, you know, the Winnipeg Jets are going to need to do whatever they can to make this young man a Winnipeg Jet forever. And I know there's still a segment of the population, and I will include myself in this. It's still... You know, you wonder how it came to be and how that ended up being the solution that the Winnipeg Jets found. And this is certainly no knock on Pierre-Luc Dubois because he's been a great, great player for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, but I knew there would come a time, Remo, when Line was going crazy and scoring every every night and, you know, everyone's talking about it. And at that point, it makes the trade look a little different considering the struggles that he's had so far this year. And you know, I tell you what, I mean, obviously the Winnipeg Jets need to sign Pierre-Luc Dubois and keep him in the mix for a long time. But if Patrick Laine does sign long-term with the Columbus Blue Jackets, I really do wonder, regardless of how great Pierre-Luc Dubois is for the Winnipeg Jets, hopefully for a long time here, I do wonder how that trade will be looked at historically um, by people in Winnipeg and fans of the Winnipeg Jets. We're going to be talking about it. We said it at the time that we'd be talking about it forever. And how, how can you not? And yeah, Patrick Laine in his last 10 games has 20 points, 12 goals, 8 assists. And we're going to be comparing, I mean, the two guys forever, as I just said, as I pull up his season numbers. I mean, Laine's got 35 points in 31 games. He was injured. Um, he had to experience the death of his father, which uh, I know was very uh, hard on him, which you mentioned. And but you look at his his numbers, as I said, 35 and 31. Pierre-Luc Dubois, 36 points in 49 games. And I mean, part of that might be ice time Dubois, maybe not be getting it. I haven't looked at the uh, per 60, but I mean, you see that production, you see the Jets having trouble scoring. You look at that shot. I mean, he's beating, he's d doing the stuff he did here. He beating, <laughs> like going down the wing and just beating goalies clean, top Chad, like in the corner. The most beautiful shot you've ever seen. The slow motion release, mm. the whip on the stick. It's absolutely magnificent. I mean, you would watch. I mean, remember the Ray Ferraro like audio of him on my front, like watching. Oh. Like he's just sees blind. <laughs> I mean, like you'd see the shot and you'd just be like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anyone shoot the puck like this. So, um, I mean, he's scored a couple overtime winners this year for Columbus, including last night against Toronto, which we all remember the famous game here where he scored the winner to, for a hat trick. Um, so uh, I guess it's just sad. That's the way to know. And, and again, it's sad that we talked about it a couple weeks ago about Bufflin, you know, how it worked out with him. And here we are again with the Jets struggling to score and out of a playoff spot so well you know what it, and it's funny and kenny brought up you know we were just talking about mark shifley and said that the joy level at times hasn't been there for shife 
um, you know, speaking of this year. And I mean, I'll go back to the 18-19 season. I mean, I don't know what the hell happened with this team in and around the break uh, at Christmas time. But I mean, I believe the Jets were like second overall in the league. And we all remember the the stumbles and the struggles. It was sort of like just waiting for the playoffs to start it. Um, you know, a real rough stretch that ended up costing them the division. Uh, and then the first round exit to the St. Louis Blues. And, you know, the, you know, uh, we all remember the media availability afterwards with some players, particularly 55, not in very good sorts, not saying very much. And, you know, I wonder how much they've been able to get back from that. At times it's looked okay, but <clears throat> I, Remo, I, I, I hope that at some point, like maybe it's 10 years down the road, somebody involved in that team could write a book about yes. what the heck happened to the 1819 Winnipeg Jets. Because there's all sorts of like theories and things like that. The bottom line is this was such a talented team that seemed to be ready to take another step from where they were the year before going to the conference finals. And literally, you can date back to that point of getting hurt for a little while and then the way everything went. I mean, to me, the the unfortunate trajectory of this team has been downhill since basically New Year's Day of 2019. And um, that's a big reason why I think we're having some of the conversations talking about where the Jets are right now in the uh, in the standings. And I don't have the answers. I think there's a pretty good group with keeping things quiet or keeping things to themselves. But I do hope at some point we find out more about um, just what went wrong because, man, it's... Uh, you know, for a lot of Winnipeg Jet fans, myself, it's really hard to see him do what he did, considering how much joy he gave fans of the Winnipeg Jets and how connected so many people still are to a guy that does some things that pretty much no one else in the National Hockey League can do. And he's doing it often right now. Yeah, absolutely. Showing up on the highlights. And I mean, I agree with what you said about the 1819 season. It seems like I remember, you know, we're talking about the, we're talking about this, but the Jets aren't quite out of the playoff spot yet. but. You know, after they lost to Vegas, like, oh, okay, yeah, you know what, they'll have another shot. And, I mean, they had a shot, but it seems like they've been on a downward uh, trajectory since, and hopefully they can reverse it. But, yeah, mm -hmm. we had that trade last year, the Line A Dubois, and, you know, you're seeing Line A, not that Dubois hasn't had highlights this year, but, I mean, you see that, you're like, oh, it would be nice if he was in a Jets jersey. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I mean, I mean, good comment from Akash Bally in Chad Huss. He says, Line A was no doubt going to outgoal Dubois, but it's the other side of the ice. We also need to look at, um, and mentioned Line A's defensive position on a Matthews goal. And I kind of agree. I mean, having a center, and you have the two centers now in Dubois and Shifley, but I think all the pieces around it doesn't seem to fit together. <laughs> and that's a <laughs> problem that Kevin Shoveldoff is going to have to navigate as we approach the trade deadline. and. We did have that clip from Frank earlier who's mentioned he heard quote-unquote rumblings about Mark. I don't know what that means. I don't know if he's just throwing that out there, but if Frank's talking about it, I think there's something Yeah, Frank's not just it. throwing it out there just because, well, you know, remember, he wants us to be talking about something that he said. I mean, he's, um, you know, they're asking about it, and that has never happened in the past. And um, as I said, you know what? I mean, listen, a lot of conversations are probably happening that no one expected to because of where this team is right now. All that being said, um, there still is a lot of hockey left to be played. And if the Winnipeg Jets don't want this to be the dominating topic on this program for the next month, uh, better get two points tonight and move on to Denver, Reem. Yeah, absolutely. And as far as Denver goes, I'm Nathan McKinnon. He's going to be out tonight. Uh, he might be out, uh, out for, or might be back Friday. So we'll wait and see. But that would be a big boost for the Jets. But honestly, it doesn't even matter. For Colorado, who's in, who's out. I mean, they've had guys in. Oh, McCarr has been. Oh, McKinnon's been. Out. The you know, Lannis Cog and Ranton have been out. They they have so many. They're so deep. It's incredible. But the Jets will have to deal with Dallas this evening. We went over the lines before. Svechnikov moving to the second line. Reichel is out. That's the line and in. Stanley, a healthy scratch for Nate Bullyu. And the Jets, they had a solid game, what, a couple Fridays ago against Dallas. Lost in overtime. You'd like to see them get a, a clean two points here. No overtimes if you want to have, you know, the shot to catch up to them. So uh, I'm looking at the, it seems like it's always good, good games when these two teams come together and, and we'll hopefully we get another one tonight. Entertaining affair. 
Yeah, no doubt about it. Oh, I see all sorts of great line A theories in the chat. Um, you know, we'll yeah. definitely have plenty of time to talk about this going forward. And uh, But hopefully we'll be preoccupied with a big win tonight and be able to get ready for that game coming up on Friday against the Colorado Avalanche. But it's all about two points tonight for the Winnipeg Jets. Let's take a quick look at the cool bet lines. And the Jets are a plus 127 underdog tonight against the Dallas Stars. Stars, a home favorite at minus 149. And the uh, the over-under in the, in the game is at six. And the over is plus 114. But considering the way the Jets have had a tough time scoring goals as of late, I mean, you'd love to see the over hit, um, hopefully with a bunch of goals from the visitors. Um, Avs at Red Wings. As Remus mentioned, no Nate McKinnon. That doesn't matter. They're still a massive favorite, minus 278 on the road. Habs and Sabres. Sabres or Habs playing a little bit better under Marty St. Louis, uh, minus 120. A home favorite. It's been a while since the Habs were laying money. Uh, Buffalo, plus 103 on the road. Oilers taking on the Champs, plus 160 for McDavid and the Oilers on the road against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Lightning at minus 189. And uh, maybe the Coyotes can do the Jets another favor. They uh, certainly did that beating the Stars a few days ago. Um, and the LA Kings right now, who come into tonight's action in that final wild card, are tied with it. 59 points, 7 points ahead of the Winnipeg Jets. Minus 204. Coyotes plus 171 at home. And uh, this would be a great time for Jet fans if the Coyotes could uh, mix in a home win. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Interesting that all the games tonight start at 6.30 p.m. I'm guessing that's for the uh, what the national broadcast. I mean, it kind of sucks if you like sitting there and flipping around games, but I guess they want the intermissions to line up because you got all the Canadian teams, Winnipeg, Montreal. That, that's got to be. That's got to be. It's the rest of the country can uh, hear them talk about last night's Leafs game Yeah, exactly. uh, in between the uh, Oilers and Habs and the uh, Jets intermission. <laughs> you know, book it, folks. <laughs> well, you know when the, when the Jets are in like a, a Saturday night game at 6 o'clock and you get to the intermission, they're not talking about the Jets game at all, so... I know Ken's in Arizona. I did give them props the other week for bringing Ken and Sean during during intermission. Uh, yeah, so, more of that, more of that, please. And of course, we'll tune in and yeah. uh, see what's going on with the uh, Kenny and Rennie gang afterwards, and of course, the legal curve after the game yeah. tonight. Before we go, we do have um, you know it is trade deadline season coming up, and the latest TSN trade bait list is out. Uh, two Jets make the list. Numbers coming in and number 16, Andrew Kopp in between Hampus Lindholm and Toronto's first rounder. Yes, Toronto's first rounder, the highest <laughs> non-roster player on the list. And Paul Stasny, I don't believe he was on the last one, but he has came in, I guess now that the Jets have slid a bit more, number 45. So those two guys seem to be gone on their way out. You wonder, you know, if the slide continues. Mm -hmm. And you wonder what they get back. Is it a second round pick? Stasny maybe a later pick. There's one other. Oh, sorry, another former generalist, Jack Rosvick. You know, we talked about in that trade. You know, Jets could use a guy uh, on the bottom six forwards, making you know some doing some scoring, and he's got doing pretty well this year with uh, what is that? Twenty points in what forty nine games here? Sorry, yeah, well, he can't be doing games. that well if he's on the list right he, now. Because, yeah, I mean, I think he's been underwhelming as to what they thought they might be getting, but, um, you know, hasn't been completely insignificant so far. And mm -hmm. you know, But the fact of the matter is that Jack Rosovic is a player that certainly has some talent, but hasn't really established himself as a, um, you know, a reliable every day in a National Hockey Leaguer, um, at least for a good team right now. And we can't forget coming in at number 25. Yes. Arizona cap space. I love Mr. C space that seems to show up on these lists all the time. I can't believe they, like, how many uh, non-roster players do they have eating up salary cap? It's so gross that this team is still around us. Um, hey, the one guy that uh, Weaver did mention uh, when we were talking to him uh, was Owen Tippett. And Owen Tippett in Florida uh, does end up coming in at 36 on the list. Um, and it has been a down year. He's still on, I believe, an entry-level contract. He's an RFA, uh, 42 games. He's got six goals and 14 points. Um, I'm not sure whether Andrew Kopp gets you Owen Tippett. I mean, it all depends on, you know, their cap structure going into next season uh, because they do think that they need to be paying him 
you know, a bunch of money to keep him in the fold and there's not a spot for him. Maybe that is a possibility and they can get in possibly a better player on a shorter term in Andrew Kopp that could help them make a push for the Stanley Cup and then make those decisions afterwards. That will be a name that we'll be watching. And one other interesting name that cracks that up there is Dano Chara, who's in at 44, still playing. Doesn't look like the Islanders are going to be making the playoffs. And it's right now, there's plenty of interest in Chara. It's just a matter of whether he wants to move and you know, make another postseason run. I personally would love to see it. More Chara, the better, as far as I'm concerned. How about Chara last night tying the record for games played by a defenseman? Um, it seemed to me like Chelios played until he was like 50. I didn't think of Chara as that old. I guess he came in young. Um, it's crazy to me that he would play... So play 1,651 games. Uh, that is incredible. What a career uh, he's had. Stanley Cup champion. Uh, you know, it was great on Ottawa. Went to Boston. Uh, and I can't believe he's still going. Tied, tied Chelios, though. Uh, with his next game, he'll tie Recchi for the seventh most in NHL history among skaters. Uh, pretty incredible for Yeah, Zidane what a run Chara. for Zdeno and Big Z still getting it done. Um, Jacob Chikrin, speaking of big blue liners, he is number one on the trade bait board. Uh, former Jet Ben Sherrod at number two, Claude Giroux, number three, Thomas Hurdle from San Jose, number four, and a uh, guy we'll see tonight, John Klingberg of the Dallas Stars in at number five. We'll certainly be uh, spending some more time on potential trade deadline moves, both for the Winnipeg Jets and around the National Hockey League in upcoming shows here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Again, just to finish up the cool bet lines, if you uh, do want to get in some action on the game or the Honda Classic, like we just talked with Reed Fowler, um, you can go to coolbet.com, use the promo code WST. And we'll double your first deposit up to 200 bucks over at coolbet.com. Um, awesome show today, Remo. And uh, tomorrow's going to be fun as well. Bomber fans, his first official visit as the new voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. We've had a great time talking to DT in the past. Derek Taylor, been on his show a bunch of times. He's coming down to Winnipeg, as Willie Jefferson would say. And he's coming down to WST tomorrow. It should be a lot of fun. Yes, I'm excited for that. We can hear from DT, you know, how it came together, what he's looking forward to. I love hearing about um, his CFL takes. I know he's a big analytics guy, so get his thoughts on uh, on free agency. So, you know, exciting times uh, for the Bombers. I'm counting down until uh, I was thinking about the home opener today. How thing of warm thoughts here while it's minus oh, 30 that's outside. Exactly right. I've got my gold eyes shirt on right now. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to see them and their new kits playing at the ballpark this summer. And yeah, we're uh, we're counting down that that first D, uh, DT call on CGOB will be a preseason game against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Uh, should make maybe an even more a little bit more fun or interesting for a preseason game. Hey, um, huge thanks to everyone that's been with us here all afternoon long in the uh, chat. Uh, if you're with us live on YouTube, do us a favor, hit that thumbs up button. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit the red subscribe button. And if you're listening to the podcast, do us a favor, give us a, a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Certainly helps us grow the channel. And um, don't forget, if you're watching a little later on, always appreciate comments on the YouTube uh, uh, the, uh, for the YouTube video. So you can just get that down if you're not with us live here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Big thanks to Nick Dembski. He was phenomenal. If you missed that, Bomber fans, get on up to the start of the episode and check that out. Ken Weeb joining us from the road, the Weeb's World Road Show. Great chat with Ken and uh, Reed Fowler of PGA Tour Live and DraftKings join us as well, talking about Phil Mickelson and uh, seemingly the crumbling of this proposed Saudi Golf League. Uh, 630 puck drop tonight. Jets and Dallas Stars. Check out the IC guys. Check out Kenny and Rennie afterwards. And make sure you're back with us tomorrow live on YouTube at 1 p.m. And in your podcast feed just after 3 p.m. Once again, a huge thanks to the uh, sponsors that make this program happen. Cool Bet Canada, Canadian Club, Nick and Nikki DQ, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, Little Brown Jug, Not Auto Corp, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Culligan Water, Vita Health, and F Apparel. For the CTO, Michael Remus, I'm Andrew Patterson. Enjoy tonight's game, and we'll talk to you tomorrow right here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Oh, my oh! God! Shut it down! Oh, Let's go home!
Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.